Yeah, hey, maybe we could, uh, uh, people can take our seats, and if I could ask just someone to step outside for those who are having coffee and tell them we're getting started here. Yeah, thanks uh, everyone for coming. I'll, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague here. We have um, I'm Ed Kelly. I'm Director for Service Delivery and Safety. Um, and since uh, I work in this building and Finn does not, I'll officially welcome you to Sal A of uh, WHO. And uh, thanks for um, getting through our uh, almost activated new security system uh, this morning. Um, and we're very pleased to be with you for the launch of this uh, WHO bulletin uh, theme issue. But yeah, before, Laura, do you want to say anything before we get started? Oh, all right. Um, everything. Um, yeah, so welcome. Thank you all very much for coming. This is a new collaboration for us with UNU WIDER. Um, we haven't worked with this uh, UN affiliated institute before, but it's been a very profitable collaboration, and we have a really nice selection of papers on quality of care. The reason that we're interested in highlighting quality of care as an issue is that in moving from the MDGs to the Sustainable Development Goals, countries really did a lot to improve coverage. So we had a lot of progress on quantitative targets, but the outcomes haven't always followed. And where we see that gap between quantitative improvements and outcomes not really following, we know there's a quality problem. And every country has not solved. No country has solved the, the overall healthcare quality problem because countries move very quickly from a situation of too little too late in terms of care, and this is across you know, the entire spectrum of all diseases, to too much too soon. And both of these are quality issues. So if you look at the papers in this um, issue, you'll find from a wide range of countries in all regions, authors trying to investigate the reasons behind the quality chasm and really looking carefully at how patients um, sh should be involved in, in determining quality, how we measure those outcomes, what the indicators are, and how we're going to make progress in that area. So thank you very much for coming. For all the interns here today, I'd really like to encourage you to consider this as a focus of your further studies because this issue is not going to be solved easily. Um, so please consider it as you're, you're moving on in your qualifications in public health. Thanks very much. Great, thanks, Laura. And just maybe I'll turn it over to, to Finn to kick us off here. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Finn Tarp. I'm the uh, director of the UNU Institute called Wider Word Institute for Development Economics Research. It's a great pleasure to be here to contribute to the uh, opening of uh, this launch event uh, of this WHO bulletin special issue. I mean, if, if you would allow me, I, I'll just say a couple of words about you and your wider, and then a few words about the um, issue, and then I'd like to add a few words of thanks uh, to colleagues who have played a key role uh, in this process. You and your wider, the United Nations University World Institute for Development Economics Research, was established uh, a bit more than 30 years ago in uh, Helsinki, Finland, as the first research center of the UN University. The university has its headquarters in uh, Tokyo um, and has about 14 institutes around the world. Um, WIDER is the institute that focuses on development economics research in an interdisciplinary way. Um, you might want to take note of the fact that one of the founding parents was Amartya Sen, so of course we have long roots in terms of human development indicators, human development issues going all, all the way back to from when we were created. Today, WIDER is a unique blend, if you wish, of a think tank, research institute, and UN agency, and we basically work both on sort of global development issues, taking up themes that we believe are coming up and are going to be important, but then we also do provide policy advice to a range of governments from South Africa to Mozambique to Tanzania to Ghana to Myanmar to Vietnam and so on. So we, we, we sort of try, as we sometimes formulate it, to deal both with the bigger development issues but also trying to engage in specific country context. 
I would encourage everyone to take a look at our website for access, free access, free downloadable access to both books, journal articles, and so on, amounting to about, well, I guess it's about 8,000 publications on key development economics issues um, that I believe are worthwhile digging into. Now, how, how, how did sort of this particular WHO billeting uh, theme issue came, uh, come about? Well, this was already referred to. <clears throat> At Union Wider, we take data and evidence serious. We do believe that data and careful analysis will have to play a crucial role in achieving the SDGs. On behalf of UNU, I was one of the 68 um, agency representatives who were involved deeply in the process of formulating the SDGs. Um, so I, I sort of, how can you say, got a keen awareness of the fact um, that uh, the call for a data revolution is, is quite unique in some ways, but it has to be followed up. This is particularly the case in relation to health. It's very clear, as has just been mentioned, that coverage has indeed expanded a lot, both in education but also in particular in health. And I think it's important to say and reiterate what was just mentioned, that this has not always been followed in a way which would have or imply high impact. At the same time, I, I don't think one should overlook the very distinct advances that have been made. At WIDA, we did a major program on uh, research in relation to foreign aid, and aid to social sectors was one of them. Now, one of the key messages that came out of that research was exactly this focus on we need to address quality issues, not just expand, 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 because, as economists would put it, there are diminishing returns to some interventions. You need to think about the quality if you want to have impact. Now, the papers of the theme issue, they do provide illuminating uh, insights into the current landscape of the quality of care research in both low- and middle-income countries. They make a strong case for investing in more and better data on health system quality, an area where countries must lead, but where development partners add critical value through the production of public goods as well as data collection tools and technologies and analytic methods. Now, if you would allow me, I'd just step out of my sort of slightly more formal um, situation right now. When I woke up this morning, uh, I, I realized it's the 14th of June, 2017. 37 years ago, in Swaziland, our first child was born. Uh, I can attest to the fact of understanding very much at the personal level what quality of care means, because the quality of care was not there. So it's just to sort of illustrate that these things are both at the global development level, but they also con concern human beings and they concern the very fundamental aspects of development, which is to increase people's welfare and well-being. So this is a core issue, both to development and to welfare, and to the lives of our children and their children. I would like to thank our partners in realizing this theme issue. From WHO, Ed Kelly and Sham Syed from the Service Delivery and Safety Department, for being a great partner in co-editing the issue. The bulletin editorial team, with a special thanks to Kiris Bartolomeus for being editor. We were really lucky indeed to have you. <clears throat> we also thank Lara Golagli and Kayleen Selig for their outstanding vision and support. It has been just such a pleasure. Now, Professor Margaret Crook, well, what should I say, the star expert in the quality of care in low and middle income countries, we have thoroughly enjoyed interacting and have appreciated very much our collaboration. Now, <clears throat> authors, some of you are here. We were indeed impressed with the quality of the selected papers. I mean, WIDA produces 
about 100 academic papers a year that appear in refereed journals, this particular theme issue will be a core element when we look back to what was achieved uh, in 2016 and 17. I am delighted to be with you here today, both personally, but also on behalf of you and you wider. And I'd like to thank everybody for being here today and for being ready to contribute to a process uh, of learning, both from the research papers and from our interactions. I look forward to our discussions and uh, appreciate the possibility for being with you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Finn, for, for that. And just before I hand it over to Margaret, a couple of thoughts just from WHO's uh, standpoint. Um, as someone who's worked in this field for a long time, um, the, the, the progress that we made has been notable. I think um, uh, the, but I think we should also be uh, humble about uh, the, the lack thereof as well. If you look at some of the work, I started uh, my public health career working, um, doing research on IMCI, the Integrated Management of Childhood Illness and the Quality of Care Delivered to Kids in uh, Niger, West Africa. So I was based in this tiny town on the edge of the Sahara Desert, Tawa, Niger, as part of a USAID uh, funded project. There are some USAID colleagues here today. And some of the results we got in terms of, you know, how, how pardon me, we traditionally measure sort of quality of care, which is how many times, when you had the opportunity to do something right, how many times did you do it right? Uh, the results we got were around sort of generally 60% of the time, whether it's sort of diagnostic work, uh, uh, therapeutic work, or communication work that the health workers were doing in these very overcrowded health centers. Um, a number of years later in the U.S., uh, publications by colleagues like uh, Beth McGlynn and others showed that actually the U.S. did only as well and often less well, around 50% of the time did we get it right. And you can see in some of the baseline um, data that are in this particular issue in different countries presented, eh, we're kind of at the same level. And so I think there is, uh, there's some lessons to be learned there around some sort of universal, uh, universality of this issue that, that, we should, that I'll just come back to. We've also, we made some progress on the issue of measurement, which is the other uh, big question within quality of care, but not enough. There's still a multiplicity of measures and not enough uh, unification around measures. We, when I first was at the OECD, we were uh, doing the OECD quality indicators. I had a good friend of mine, I can use his name, Jan Mainz, who's from Denmark. He's thought of, very well thought of in the um, quality world, told me flat out, we will never be able to report on quality of care across countries because the systems are too different, it's just the, you won't be able to talk uh, about it. Now, 10 years later, the quality of care indicators um, are regularly reported by the OECD. They were reported at their ministerial meeting uh, just earlier this year. So we have made some, some progress, but the number of indicators on which we can agree is, is very scanty. It's around 10, 11, 12, even for the OECD. Um, and on improvement, um, yeah, what can I say? Uh, there are as many different methods of quality improvement out there as there are sort of practitioners uh, in, in the world on it. And I think looking at how we can come together on that is another, is another area. But, uh, you know, I think the, the prospect and the, and the possibilities are, are very high. Laura referred to this and also Finn, our new pardon me, leadership here at WHO, uh, uh, Dr. Tedros has taken over as the Director General, um, has picked up the, the mantle from our uh, current Director General on the issue of universal health coverage as being a top priority. If you look at how WHO um, uh, has formulated universal health coverage, quality is not part of the UHC cube. It is not, is not something we've thought about. It is, we have basically thought in a supply side orientation around uh, universal coverage, sort of build more things, get more health workers, and push out more drugs, and we will solve the world's health problems. Clearly, that is not happening in most parts of the world, and some of the, some of the evidence here uh, will show that. Uh, there's a big love at the current um, time in, at least in WHO, but in other circles too, on conceptual models and how can we frame sort of health system strengthening in UHC. For me, this is, uh, 
I'm not so interested in all of that. And, and if anyone in this room before the end of the day says, raises their hand and says, can I just ask, what do we really mean when we're talking about quality? I'm sorry you're going to have to get out of the room because we are, we're not going to get into those sorts of questions. But I think we spent too much time talking about the definitions of quality and framing quality and not enough about learning from the tons of experiences that are out there and, come, and building from the bottom up on that. So I think we do have uh, those possibilities and that this could be a big unifier across not just for health systems, certainly, but also with our colleagues in maternal and child health. A number of them are here and you've just had a really uh, positive and energizing meeting this week on a new network that's uh, active in this space, but also with our disease programs. Each of the big disease programs here, and then also neglected tropical diseases, all have different programs looking at quality of care, whether it's indicators, community engagement, uh, or um, sort of improvement activities. I think there are a number of very promising uh, initiatives, one of which is led by Margaret and the new Lancet Commission, which maybe she'll say a quick word on. And uh, there's also work within WHO and our team uh, on this that's uh, led by SHAMS uh, and looking at trying to bring together uh, within the house a, a, a task force on this, as well as a group of external uh, team looking at this and a learning laboratory that's looking at how we can advance learning within this space and, and the learning agenda around it, as well as policy uh, questions, which we have a meeting on national quality policy issues, which has been a missing a big gap for some of the champions locally. They haven't had a policy environment in which to, to work. So I think all of those are very positive. But I think, you know, the bottom line is we should be pushing this agenda because for me, um, it, uh, it's where the supply side of our work actually meets the demand side. And as a supply-oriented institution, as WHO is, we miss this piece too often. We have a program, um, our Patients for Patient Safety program, some folks are in the room helped us start that, where we had patient safety champions who they themselves or their family members were harmed by care and they told us their stories. And it's amazing if you take, I frequently start my presentations with an example from a woman from uh, Uganda businesswoman from Uganda um, and who saw her child die in a hospital and a man from New York City who saw his mother pass away and the experience they had of the medical teams uh, insensitivity and the lack of proper protocols and treatment and communication, there's some universal way we are constructing our systems that a person in Uganda and a person in New York City can have such similar experiences of poor care that we need to take a look at. And I think this, uh, again, h highlights how what a unifying uh, issue this could be for us going forward in a new era. So I thank um, you and Wider in particular for pushing us forward on this uh, issue and Laura and the, te Laura and the team for, for uh, making space and a very crowded publication schedule. Um, uh, I have a new appreciation uh, for how solicited uh, they are, uh, but also for Margaret and the team for, for the organization around the papers and all the authors who are here. We've really pulled together something I think that is, uh, that is really uh, very interesting. So without any further comments, I thank you for that and I'll turn it over to Margaret. Thanks very much. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be here uh, with you um, at what is, I think, been a, over a year's worth of work, actually, probably 15 or 16 months, so uh, a wonderful culmination of the work of many of the people sitting around this table, uh, and I couldn't be happier, actually, with, with what we have in front of you today, which is a special issue of the Bulletin of the WHO. So let me go back to the MDGs, the era that's just passed. Um, the MDGs have had indeed many successes. I would say that chief among them is the much greater coverage of life-saving interventions that they ushered forth. Um, that means something very specific. I think some of us are bean counters and love to count numbers, but really it is meaningfully different now to be a pregnant woman in many countries and know that you're going to be able to get delivery care uh, at a facility, that there is a path forward on that, that you have somewhere to take your sick child. Um, so I think those are, those are incredibly important uh, achievements. And those achievements and coverage actually were accompanied in parallel by an incredible explosion of great research on coverage, understanding how to measure access at the individual level, at the population level, and even the equity of access, which is such an important dimension. Who's getting care? Where are they getting care? How hard is it to get to care? 
Uh, and many colleagues around the world have contributed to building the evidence base on coverage and measuring it systematically across countries. And what that allows is for comparison and peer pressure uh, and, and for progress. Uh, so I think the, the research uh, part of this can't be understated and the importance of that in moving health for people, improving health. Um, and so we know that the MDGs have also had notable successes in actually improving health, improving survival. Um, and they've done that undoubtedly in several areas. Uh, they have not succeeded in other areas. Uh, and it is, I think, instructive to reflect on where the MDGs have struggled, um, actually, where we have struggled in achieving the MDGs. And often that has been in some of the more complex conditions, maternal mortality, which requires a chain of events to happen, to happen on time, to happen with care, uh, pieces to be there of the entire health system. We haven't done very well for newborns, actually, globally. We've made some improvement, but really not nearly as much as we need to. And now, to today, in 2017, we're actually past the dawn of the Sustainable Development Goal era. I was reminded by your wonderful huge circle that health you know, is, is doing its usual takeover of the rest of the, the goals uh, being in the middle. But then what do the SDGs really mean for us, those of us who think about health systems and people's right to health? Well, the SDGs mean more conditions that we should be thinking about. It's no longer maternal child health and a few infectious diseases. It's a wide range of conditions. It means more complexity. The people who are not saved by current interventions are sicker people. They're the sicker newborns. They're the septic newborns. They're the moms with severe complications. They're people with chronic disease now um, that will need lifelong care. Also, we know multimorbidity is a growing issue. As populations survive some of the early years and grow on to be older, which is a goal that we all share and want, um, they're getting sicker and, and have often two or three uh, conditions. Um, and then let's not forget this, while health is changing and the profile of health conditions is changing, people's demand for good care is also changing. Uh, we are no longer in a world where people don't know what good care looks like. They can easily text their cousin in Dar es Salaam if they are in a small village and find out what happened when she went to clinic. Uh, people see on TV the way that good doctors behave with, with patients and, and worse doctors uh, behave with patients. The connectivity, and by the way, empirically, we're seeing it in our research. People with cell phones have different demands um, for, from healthcare, even adjusting, frankly, for their education. And we are seeing greater education, of course. Uh, and we are seeing, fortunately, growing wealth. So demand for care quality is growing as well. So all of these uh, uh, all of these circumstances, I think, bring us to the question of quality. Um, it is difficult to imagine making progress on the SDG agenda, and it is certainly impossible to think of how we can satisfy the needs of populations uh, without thinking carefully about quality. Um, and so actually, Ed, I will define quality um, here, because I do think that one of the, the challenges has been that it has become a splintered and very multifaceted uh, uh, issue. I don't think it's that complicated. Quality to me has at least two key features. It is healthcare that can either improve or maintain health. Of course, a lot of healthcare is preventive, so we don't have to always be improving health, but we should be helping maintain it, number one. And number two, it is healthcare that brings value to people above and beyond the, the improvement in health. Remember, many conditions are self-limiting. People want to come out of a visit feeling respected so they know that they can go back when the, when the real uh, urgent need arises. So this notion of value to people uh, is something that I think um, uh, we haven't been thinking enough about uh, in thinking about quality. So um, that's, that's what I would say a definition is. I, I think that there are several elements uh, that are particularly worth paying attention to. And here, now I'm taking the perspective of the patient, the user of the system. So what do I see when I enter a clinic? I've gotten coverage, I know where to go. I come into clinic and I'm really thinking of two fundamental elements when I'm judging quality. I'm thinking about the competence of that provider. In fact, it's my perception of the competence that may have led me to this clinic in the first place. Uh, is this person going to have the skills to help my baby? The, the reference you made to your son's birth. We all, everyone in this room who's had a child knows how hard we all look for the right exact provider with the right support system that's gonna help that delivery happen. Or whether when our child, as my daughter did, fractured her arm, where is the right exact place to go that will, that will give me the technical competence I need? So we need competent care. Everyone has the same demand for that. But the second part is we want a good experience. At the, at the fundamental level, this is a personal experience of healthcare. 
Uh, this is, I am also a customer. I am not just a patient begging for your time. Um, and so I expect respect. I expect ease of use. Um, I expect a good consumer interface, frankly, with a system. And so the patient experience and the competence are two fundamental parts of, of quality in terms of the process of that care. And then if I do get that, what are the benefits to me? If I do get that, um, hopefully I will, my health will be better. Now, hopefully that can be objectively measured, but sometimes what matters most is actually how I feel and whether my symptoms are improved. Uh, we've seen increasing wealth of evidence, including recently a very prominent article in, in the oncology field showing that patient reported outcomes, what people tell us they're feeling, are actually tracking very, very well with survival and with other um, hard clinical outcomes. So we've got to be paying attention to how people are doing. That goes for uh, postpartum mothers, whether they're depressed, whether they're uh, looking after themselves, whether they have symptoms, as well as people with chronic and other illness. Um, so we care about health, certainly, but also good quality brings other benefits. Those include greater confidence in the health system for the next time I get sick or the next time my child gets sick, or God forbid we have an outbreak of Ebola or some other uh, condition, where now I think, okay, do I have a base of trust with the local clinic, with the health system at large? I assure you, if you don't have that base of trust, no amount of government radio messages at the height of the crisis are going to drive me to the health system. Um, the third benefit is greater and better utilization. Those of you in the fields of HIV, TB, in chronic care know very well how difficult it is to retain people in care. And yet when we go around the world and we ask uh, uh, health program managers, what do you, how do you know your, your program is working? The first thing they say is, well, we can retain people. And they're right. The idea that people stay in care is a vote of loyalty uh, to that system. And so retention, actually, an appropriate utilization, timely utilization, uh, avoidance of overutilization, by the way, is also really important, and also efficient utilization. So thinking about economics, you're not always going to one center which is overcrowded, but actually the quality is good enough at your nearest facility that you could go there. All right? So utilization is another one. And finally, a benefit of high quality, of course, is finances. So populations who get good quality care can go once instead of getting the three second opinions that they might need, the second, the third, the fourth. And you might think I'm exaggerating, or maybe you think I'm talking about high income countries where we're very picky. No, actually it's Liberians, one of the poorest countries in the world, where we found on average for every formal healthcare visit, there were two additional visits to informal providers to just make sure that this was on track, okay? So this matters, and this has an effect on people's pocketbooks and their economies. Um, so I hope, that I persuaded you this matters. I don't think I've had to persuade you if we came to this, uh, to this launch that quality is a, a critical element as we move forward on the SDGs. So then the question arises, what do we know? Where is the great research? Just like on coverage, research was fundamental in, in making progress happen. What about quality? And there, I agree with Ed, I agree with many of the comments that were made. There's a lot of work going on in many countries. And yet I would say that today, in 2017, our talk, outstrips our knowledge, and our assumptions outnumber our facts and out our evidence. There are extremely few systematic comparisons of quality indicators across countries, OECD accepted, I'm really thinking now about low and middle income countries, indicators where we can say with assurance, this is nationally representative, right? This is measured in the same way across countries, and we were at an extremely basic step in terms of being able to do this sort of benchmarking. But let's forget about the international comparison. What about countries themselves? What do they know about how their health systems are working? Well, actually, very often, they don't know much, or they know pieces, and that's perhaps more, more accurate. They'll know how a TB program is working here because those partners are actually reporting and, and doing a great job. Um, they, they have a patchwork. They don't have an overall sense of how the health system is performing. And so uh, I am extremely grateful to the Bulletin um, and colleagues at UNUIDER and the World Health Organization for working with us to put together this issue uh, on quality. What we tried to do here, and quality measurement more specifically, what we tried to do in this issue is to, to uh, uh, walk far and wide reach out to the best researchers working in this area of quality measurement to say, bring us your best work, bring us your best evidence, talk to us about measurement, how do we do it? Across all conditions, it wasn't just one set of conditions or another, um, tell, us, tell us what we need to do better. Uh, and I think we have a wonderful set of papers. More importantly, even, I would say, than the empirical findings, which we'll hear about in a moment, is the stimulus that we hope this issue brings 
to the field of quality research. Uh, I'm talking about research and measurement, I'm talking about description, I'm talking about analysis, I'm talking about better evaluation of improvement, the full range of research needs to get bigger and better and soon. Um, finally, let me just say a word about the Lancet Global Health Commission on High Quality Health Systems, which I have the great privilege of chairing together with Dr. Mohamed Pate uh, and 30 amazing commissioners, many of whom are actually in the room and advisory council members. This is a, an 18 month effort uh, to try to define quality in a clear and simple way that health ministers and, and line uh, uh, managers of health systems can understand, not just experts at WHO or in academia. Um, and also to describe the best that we can quality across conditions, SDG conditions, talk about improvement, uh, what's working, and, and, and very critically about the equity of quality, who's really getting good care in countries, because uh, we don't think it's necessarily the poor. Uh, so that work is, is ongoing and we hope to publish a final report in October of 2018. So just over a year from now, uh, the time is running fast. Um, so we look forward to all of your input on that through our website, um, which is hqsscommission.org. Um, happy to talk about that on the side, but I wanna return now to this uh, uh, incredible group of uh, authors uh, to tell us about uh, the findings in, in this special issue. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Margaret. So we have a selection of these fantastic authors sitting up here, and we're going to hear from them in turn. Lupe from the World Bank is going to start off telling us about infection prevention and control practices in primary care in Kenya. Um, if you could walk us through your findings. Thanks. Who is managing the presentation? Our two ladies right here. Okay, yeah, because... It has a lot of animation, so oh, I may need to... Okay, you may need to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about our results uh, from uh, analysis of compliance uh, with infection prevention and control practices in Kenya. Uh, this is a part of a bigger project that is the Kenya Patient Safety Impact Evaluation uh, that uh, I am a part of uh, with uh, a group of colleagues from the World Bank, but this is only one of the tools that we are using to measure quality of care. Okay, so first, um, why is this important? I don't think like, I have to motivate a lot for this audience. Uh, Healthcare-associated infections are a priority, a global priority, and IPC practices are um, relatively easy and cost-effective ways of preventing uh, health-related infections. Um, but the problem and the challenge, uh, as, as the, um, the speakers have emphasized now, is that there is very little research on the extent of the problem, and particularly in low and middle income countries and for primary care settings. Most of the studies are focused on small samples, focus on only one dimension or one of the sites, and in many occasions on cell reports. So to address these uh, limitations, we um, build or uh, use a, an observational patient tracking tool to measure uh, IPC compliance in uh, different domains and sites. And we conducted the largest patient safety survey uh, across uh, low and middle income countries that we are aware of with more than 1,000 health facilities, uh, around 1,700 healthcare workers, and more than 14,000 patients. So what did we do? First, we decided, uh, we selected three procedures that we were going to observe. They are examinations, injections, and lab tests. We decided on five domains that we were going to track. It's, they are hand hygiene, protective gloves, injections, and blood sampling, reusable equipment, which is basically disinfection of stethoscopes and uh, thermometers, and waste segregation. And the idea is that what we wanted to track is that the average experience of a patient through outpatient services in Kenya. Then we developed, no, could you back? When we developed a tool and basically what we did is that we built on a WHO tools that were already available and validated, but we put them all in one checklist that is a two-pager where we actually track all the indication which are the cases in which uh, there is risk of pathogen transmission in, the, in these uh, uh, procedures, and also the actions that the healthcare workers took. And the idea was to fill in this checklist in uh, on average five minutes that uh, an outpatient consultation uh, lasts. 
Then what we did is that we train assessors, and very importantly, we use tags. So all the patients that we track had adhesive tags, and the healthcare workers as well, so that we could actually follow them through the healthcare facility or uh, through different uh, sites for the healthcare workers. We also measured knowledge at the end of the observation, and we also measured whether they had uh, the available supplies. So the main results first. I don't think you can see it very well, but I'm going to try to describe it. First is that we found very low compliance with the 20 IPC practices that we analyzed, 32% on average. And this figure that is showing there, the, the top of the figure shows you the indications, which are the cases in which an action uh, should have taken because of the risk of transmission of pathogens. And the line below tells you the violations, the safety violations. And in summary, just to, to give you a, a point of, of the analysis, that the first one, the 3.1 and 2.9, is if a patient only goes through examination, which was 50% of the patients, usually all the, all the indications are safety violations. So it's three indications and three safety violations. The last one is if a patient goes to examination and has at least one lab test and at least one injection, they are exposed to 23 indications and 13 violations. So it gives you an idea of, of the main results. The second one is the second important result is that there is significant variation across all domains. So hand hygiene, which is the current store on IPC, the compliance was 2% which was very low, and then very high in anything that was related with infection, uh, injections, and blood draws. So 87% on the practices that we measure, and 82% of the waste segregation of needles and syringes. The rest of the, of the practices were to needle to very low compliance. <coughs> the next, uh, you, yeah. in the next one, um, we found very significant no-do gaps. So in the first one, just to give you an example, that's the compliance, knowledge, and supplies for hand hygiene. So what you find in the first one is that in 83 of the cases, healthcare workers actually knew what to do, in which cases to wash their hands. In 70% 70, 70 of the cases, they had the supplies that were required for the practice, but in only 2.4 of the cases, actually you, uh, they practice, right? And what happens is that when we condition that and do that average only for the healthcare workers who actually knew and also had the supplies, that only jumps to 4%. So 2% on average for all of them, but when you only do the, the, the average for when they had supplies and knowledge, it only jumps to 4%. So what are the, the other element is that there is a very weak association with anything that we measure at the healthcare worker or health facility level, the age, the education, the gender, uh, whether the facility was big or, or large, many of the things were weakly associated. Can you go? What are the policy implications on this one is that there is a progress in, in some areas. So what we found is that all the uh, campaigns that have been conducted for in injection and blood draw safety actually have been effective because, for instance, in one of the indicators where they were using new needles and syringes, it was 100% compliance. And that was a surprise for everybody because every time that I have presented this, people don't expect these results. However, uh, one of the things that we found is that this weak association between knowledge and supplies and all the other uh, characteristics means that it's more about uh, behavioral uh, uh, elements or constraints, and that remains the biggest challenge on, on what to do, how to affect behavior. You can move on. Okay, some caveats and takeaways to finalize. Caveats are that uh, we cannot currently link this compliance indicators to health outcomes. We don't have a research that actually indicates how to weight them. Um, we are centering this in, in, in the interaction between healthcare worker and uh, the patient, so we are missing a lot of things that happen outside of that interaction, for instance, the rest of the waste management, and uh, healthcare workers may change their behavior while they are observed. We actually tested this and we didn't find evidence for this. And the main takeaways, uh, first, this observational tool was effective for assessing compliance with uh, these practices across every type of health facility uh, in very short period of time because on average uh, it took five minutes for each interaction. 99% of the patients and 100% of the healthcare workers consented to be observed, which was another thing that was concerning at the beginning uh, for us. There is high variance but overall low compliance and uh, the conclusion is that improved improvements will require a broad focus on, on behavioral change. That's it. Thank you.
Fantastic. Thank you, Lisa. What I'd like to do is suggest that we go through all the summaries of the papers and that we take your questions at the end, if, that, if that's all right. I just, um, I'm sorry to say that Marcia Lazzarini, who is going to present the next study on improving the quality of, labor of hospital care for children in Kyrgyzstan, is unable to join us. There's no other author present from that paper who would like to speak about it? Anyone involved with that study? Anthony, there's no one from your group? No? Okay, so we'll skip that one. Um, but, and we'll go directly to Gaurav Sharma over here on my right from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who's going to speak about the quality of routine essential care during childbirth, um, clinical observations of uncomplicated births in Uttar Pradesh in India. And if you're finding it difficult to see the contrast on the slides, please note that most of the figures and tables, of course, are in the journals um, which have been distributed to you. Garva, thanks. Okay, thank on our paper, which is in this special supplement, and I'm presenting on behalf of uh, the other co-authors and would also like to acknowledge our funders. So we chose to focus on uh, routine care because that seems to be neglected in programs and also in research, and we did this in three districts in Uttar Pradesh. Next um, slide. So just to, I, I, I was only given five minutes, so I mean it's a lot to pack in uh, the five minutes, but all the details are in the paper, but we conducted an observational study using clinical observations, using 14 enumerators who visited admissions, emergency uh, wards, labor room, postnatal wards, uh, wherever uh, pregnant women who are likely to undergo normal vaginal births were. And um, we did this across 26 health facilities, um, eight in the private sector and 18 in the public sector. And to calculate the required number of observations uh, at each facility, we had done power calculations for all of the key indicators, and we used um, uh, WHO guidelines and available um, tools to develop a data collection instrument. And we conducted extensive pretesting of the um, tool itself, and also uh, did a thorough pilot study for three days in the public sector and four days in the private sector to finalize logistics during data collection. So we realized uh, that in this setting, there are not many normal births that happen in the private sector, so we needed to spend a longer time at those facilities. And data was collected between uh, May and July. So uh, overall, we collected data on 42 items of care using a very comprehensive framework that included um, adherence to evidence-based practices, harmful care practices, um, harmful behaviors by the health worker, and harmful practices, but also aspects of women-centered, respectful maternity care. And what we find is overall across the board, quality of care was very poor, with a mean score of 35.7 across all of the facilities. So women on average only received about 35% of the recommended uh, practices. Um, and uh, so a neonatal care was slightly, so this is only immediate newborn care, which was slightly better than obstetric care, which were, which were both poorer, but we found a significant difference between the quality in the private sector versus the quality in the public sector. And um, so, 40, uh, so women on average for uh, overall essential care at the time of birth received about 45% of the recommended practices in the private sector, but only 33 in the public sector, and you can see the rest there. And those were significant, um, significantly different across the sector. But these are aggregate scores, so obviously they hide a lot of variation. So maybe if we go to the next one. So if we look at uh, certain key indicators, the quality was, um, uh, as you can see in these um, graphs, uh, the quality was really poor, so for example, and, and the indicators with a star in them are the ones that were significant across the um, sectors. So regular monitoring of labor using a pyrograph less than 1%, screening for preeclampsia, eclampsia less than uh, 3%, uh, infection prevention was better in the private sector, assessment of uh, maternal blood loss better in the private sector, uh, provision of women-centered respectful care practices things like uh, explaining the process of the labor, allowing a companion to be present, 
um, offering a choice of position um, were really poor, less than 4%. And also for newborn care, this was um, overall poor quality. Obviously, I mean, there are problems with many of these indicators. If we look at individual indicators and the validity of many of these indicators is also questionable. And I mean, research work is ongoing to look at some of this. But uh, so overall, uh, pathograph use, infection prevention, maternal blood loss, and um, assessment of fetal heart rate seem to be done in the majority of uh, private sector cases compared to the public sector. And the other interesting, can we go to the next one? The other interesting thing that we found is that, um, so unqualified personnel frequently provide institutional maternity care in this setting and um, in both the public and the private sector. But if we, if we look at this um, um, graph, a, a larger proportion of doctors provided care in the private sector compared to the public sector, but uh, greater proportions of staff nurses, auxiliary nurse midwives, traditional birth attendants, dyes, other unqualified personnel provided care in the public sector. Um, so this was what, an interesting finding that we found. If we go to the next one. So, uh, so that was um, the descriptive analysis. And then we conducted a multivariate uh, analysis using a mixed effects regression model with a random effect at the level of the uh, health facility to account for the clustering. And after adjusting for all of the confounders related to the women's characteristics, health workers' characteristics, um, and um, uh, caseload at facilities, uh, day, time of admission, we find that uh, there was no difference, no significant statistical difference between the care, care provided between qualified and unqualified birth attendants. We found that private sector provided a six percentage point, a small six percentage point higher overall uh, care at the time of birth. We didn't find any association between facility size or the volume and the quality of care at birth. Uh, and, but um, but uh, we found that quality of care during weekdays as compared to weekends, uh, were, during weekends the quality of care was three percentage points poorer. So having said that, I mean, um, it's, it's uh, the findings are slightly nuanced in the sense that there were problems with sampling the private sector. Uh, in this part of India, um, there are lots of private sector clinics. So maybe every 500 meters there is one private sector clinic and we didn't really have a um, sampling frame for the, or a census for all of the private sector facilities in the district. And um, 13 of the private sector facilities that we contacted refused to participate in the study. So their quality may have been different to the ones who agreed to participate in the study. And um, they may also have been observer bias due to the general perception that private sector is better uh, because it has um, you know, uh, better infrastructure or shinier facilities or better, tra better uh, qualified health workers. But uh, so in summary, these are our key findings. And if there are any questions, we can discuss. Thank you. Back to you, Margaret, um, for your study in several countries on primary health care services and quality. Thank you, uh, Lara. Uh, OK, so, um, so together with, with our team um, that uh, are the co-authors um, in this work, which uh, I'm also having trouble seeing, but I can see them in my uh, printed program, including some wonderful doctoral students, postdocs, and colleagues in uh, Tanzania, colleagues uh, in Tanzania. We um, ask this question, um, why does quality vary? How much does it vary and, and why, uh, why, why does it vary? Uh, and, and particularly looking at the range of countries that are listed here, uh, seven uh, low and middle income countries. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so let me say a little bit about a variation and why is this interesting. Uh, I think for a very long time in healthcare, in particular, I would say in uh, wealthier countries with extremely well-developed and expensive health systems, there's been a lot of interest in understanding variation 
uh, with the idea that variation that is not accounted for by patient status, right, and patient need is what's called unwarranted variation and may reflect bad quality. It may reflect deviation from evidence. Because if you think about it, controlling for what the patient needs uh, the evidence base should be pointing everyone in the same direction for the care of conditions, certain conditions. Um, and so, uh, and particularly this is the case for primary care sensitive conditions that require pretty algorithmic set of uh, things to be done. And so we thought, why not use that same approach of variation analysis to uh, the systems of lower income countries and to analyze the, the variation levels, but also what factors might explain it. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this study is based on a nationally representative uh, uh, set of health system surveys, an incredibly rich data set from the service provision assessment surveys um, from Kenya, Malawi, Namibia, Rwanda, Senegal, Uganda, and Tanzania. These were done between 2006 and 2015, so relatively recent data. And these surveys contain an audit of all the facility stuff, infrastructure, equipment, medicines, staff, personnel, um, as well as, uh, I think this is the more exciting part, provider interviews, direct observations of care, and even patient exit interviews. So we do have a multidimensional view of quality from these, from these studies. Um, in this study, we particularly focused on two critical services, antenatal care and sick child visits. And the way sick child visits work is basically the observers observed any sick child, any child that was in um, for any illness uh, to be seen by a clinician in, in a clinic. The, I should also note, just up to the point about private and public, these surveys include both public and private facilities in all the study countries, and the weighting uh, the, actually it makes these representative, so they do tell us about what's going on across the health system. Next, please. Um, so um, the way that we define clinical quality here was the proportion of essential clinical actions completed out of a very, uh, I would say, parsimonious, very small set of what we considered the most essential antenatal care actions and sick child actions. So eight for antenatal care, nine for sick child care. These are taken from global guidelines, IMCI guidelines, ANC guidelines. Uh, but we wanted to just really focus in on the fundamentals. Were the fundamentals done? You know, was the mom asked about past, uh, for example, birth complications, this kind of thing. Um, and these were in the domains of history exam, diagnostics, and counseling and management. So again, this spans, spans the range of care. Um, what we then did is we used uh, multi-level random intercept models, which is a way to um, understand data that are, that are clustered. So these, the way to think about this is um, one provider might do multiple visits, right? So the visits were clustered within providers. Of course, one provider, is, uh, several providers are within one clinic. So that's another level of clustering. And then, of course, provider clinics are within countries. And so we applied multi-level modeling, uh, but also included a country fixed effect to make sure that we captured inter-country differences um, as well. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so what did we, um, what did we find? Um, first of all, there were a lot of data, uh, which is a, a, wonderful, um, a wonderful thing. Uh, in terms of il illuminating what's going on. And I should remind everyone, this is data collected by direct observation. So somebody standing in the corner of the room with a checklist and going down to see what actually is getting done. Not, not what they said was getting done, not what providers said and knowledge to us, but actually what did they do for these sick kids and the moms. Um, so we have 2,600 ANC visits, almost 12,000 sick child visits, uh, which is a lot of data in this quality sphere as we've discussed earlier. 80% of the facilities are public facilities. Again, that's because the majority of provision in these countries is from the public sector. Um, so we also assessed, in addition, to the, our key outcome variable was the observed quality, but we were very interested to see, obviously, the factors that might explain variation. And one of those factors might be facility equipment and supply. So we wanted to um, also test that. So for example, facilities scored on average between 50 and 75% of basic inputs, and this is based on the service um, uh, readiness index that the WHO has developed, uh, just to say, is this facility got the stuff it needs to, to give this care? Um, so about 50 to 75% stocks. Um, the average quality that was observed uh, to be given was about 62%. I think as you said 60% is roughly what gets done. Well, 60% is what got done in antenatal care, and less than that of those eight or nine recommended actions in sick child care. I can also tell you these numbers are slightly upward biased. When we take the full range of uh, actions that could have been done, not eight, but really 25 or so that really should be done for a sick child, these numbers fall even lower. But these are the most essential. So this is, in a way, the best case scenario. Next. 
Okay, a little hard to see here, but um, these, uh, these lines represent the mean and the inner quartile range, 25th to 75th percentile of the uh, observed quality of care. And this um, uh, is for, uh, for both, actually, sorry, I don't think you can see very well, yeah. Um, there are two colors here, but if you look at your, at your bulletin, uh, bulletin issue, um, you will see that, uh, let, me, let me point you to the page. Let's, let's open it up together. Um, page 412, yes, very good, okay. So, all right, um, so um, th that's why they're not showing up. The very light bars are for um, uh, antenatal care and the darker bars, the ones you can actually see on this slide, are for sick child care. So let me just point a few things here. First of all, you can see these bars move all around. Each bar, by the way, represents one country's worth of clinics. So these are across all the different countries. Um, so there are countries that are doing uh, better than others. That's very clear from this, from this graph. It isn't always the obvious things, though. If you look at Namibia, which is the richest country in this group, by far, actually, the richest country, it's scoring, in terms of uh, sick child care, about the same as Kenya. Um, so that's interesting to us. Why is Kenya a much poorer country doing a better job? And then other countries with similar incomes to Kenya, on the other hand, are doing uh, less well. Uh, so you do see these intercountry differences. The other thing I would like to point your attention to is the size of that bar. So this is the, the, the majority of the data are quite scattered. There's wide variation uh, in, within each country also of the care delivered. Um, what you again can't see but that's better in the journal is that um, interesting to us was also the fact that countries that did well on sick child care didn't 100% of the time do well as well on antenatal care. Some did better on antenatal care, some did worse. I would say that of the two services, antenatal care is more formulaic, right? It's preventive care, people are not sick in front of you. So it should in some ways be easier to score those eight items, but we didn't see those clear, uh, um, we didn't see that, well, on average they did do better on A and C, but, but some countries didn't. Um, all right, let's move on to the next uh, slide. This you obviously can't read at all, um, and that's okay, because I'm gonna summarize what this says on the next slide, please. This is for the geeks in the room, um, okay. So this is the, uh, the, the quick interpretation of what we found. Probably the top line is, after, well there's several, several key messages. After we adjusted, um, so we were trying to explain what, what we're seeing, what the quality, explain the observed quality. Um, what we did is we tried to use all the factors that we can think of from a, a well-developed set of conceptual models, what could drive quality, could it be provider motivation, could it be provider cotter, could it be uh, the equipment in the clinic, could it be, I, it, I think we had 20 variables in this model because the data are large enough to permit that sort of exploration. Um, we also then looked at patient level factors. Maybe if the, if the child is younger, maybe if the child is sicker. So we included visit level factors as well as provider level factors, clinic level factors, and finally countries. At the end of all that, we weren't really able to explain very much of the variation in these data, okay? So in particular, after all of these uh, factors were put in, uh, in to explain quality, we found that nine, only 19% of the variation in antenatal care, and, but 41% of the variation in sick child care, um, uh, um, sorry, the, let me go to the second bullet. The full models explain 40% of the variation. So 40% of the differences in quality in A and C and only half of that in sick child care. Um, what I wanna do, emphasize in the first bullet though, was actually what we found surprising was there was a lot of variation within providers from visit to visit. But actually less for antenatal care and more for sick child care, the providers clearly could do more and did more for some kids. And then they didn't do it again for the next child. So this kind of uh, um, intra-provider variation, visit to visit variation. Um, what we also found though, that after all, um, all our uh, um, covariates were taken into account, all the explanatory factors were taken into account, the single biggest, by far, explanatory factor for the variation was what country was this visit in. 80% of the explained variance was due to the country fixed effect in these models. Um, so that's, that's a, a key finding, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, other findings, um, A and C quality was lower among physicians and clinical officers than nurses, um, was higher in private clinics and was better in facilities with better infrastructure, equipment and management. Um, those were some differences. Um, but let me explain the size of these differences. Being in Uganda, 
was linked to 30% versus um, the, the comparison country, which I believe was Malawi in this case, the poorest country was the, was the comparison. So being in Uganda versus Malawi was linked to 30% better care, while better infrastructure was associated with 3% better care. Just to show you the size of the country effect versus the size of the, uh, uh, of the effect of the, um, of the inputs uh, to care. So huge, huge variations across countries. Let's go to the next slide, please. So I think the question is why? What, what are we seeing and, and what does this lead to? Um, so um, on this chart, what we're showing is each of the set of bars there is showing you the performance of worse and better facilities uh, in each country. And, um, and those of you following this, this is on page 415 um, in, the, in the journal. Um, what we're showing is that the lightest bar on the right-hand side shows you what the top quartile, the top quarter of facilities in the country could accomplish. So look at that. Within the same country, there is a set of facilities doing substantially better than the poorest facilities, which says to me there is knowledge in this country and demonstrated ability to provide some better quality care. Um, and so what I'm, I think, really eager to do, and I would really encourage this is a, 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 for all the interns and researchers in the room, is an important direction for future research is understanding best performers, understanding positive deviant analysis, understanding what's going on in those clinics that can help guide us. Um, I think the other big questions to my mind are why do countries produce such different levels of quality? What is it about those countries that's doing it? It's not always income. That's not the, that's not the single um, predictor, as you saw with the Namibia case. Um, and so one of the things that uh, our commission um, is looking into in greater depth is whether pre-service education really is all that comparable or sufficiently or sufficient um, as we look across countries, whether that can help explain um, some of these differences, frankly, are providers prepared. Um, and then I think the other uh, piece uh, is how do we actually get providers to do the right thing for every child, <laughs> not just for the one child a day, uh, but for every child? Um, because again, we are not asking much in this index. We're asking for eight or nine items to be done properly, basic uh, uh, assessment of the child. Um, and so I think that's my last slide. Can you, uh, oh, uh, no, that was just a backup slide for those interested in what exactly was, uh, was included in these quality measures. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. I'm sure we're gonna come back with questions on this study, I remember myself. <laughs> Um, Barbara, I'd like to hand over to you now. Um, Barbara's going to tell us about some work done with colleagues in WHO on developing global indicators for quality of maternal and newborn care. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, oops. Sorry. Um, so, yes, so thank you for the introduction. So, um, I come from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, and uh, I'd like to share with you the findings of a feasibility assessment um, run with two of, uh, so two of, with with four other people, but two of the co-authors are actually here in the, in the room today, um, on quality of care indicators developed through um, with WHO. So the background is that with the increasing focus on, uh, on quality of care, but lack of standards, there was clearly a need to develop those um, as a matter of obviously being able to measure what is actually happening with the quality of care. So the discussions had been ongoing um, as part of that group since 2010. Then in 2013, um, 70 um, experts got together to discuss what would be the core indicators that need to be included to cover uh, quality of care um, with regard to mothers, newborns and children. And they came up with a list of 19 indicators, uh, six on maternal care, five on newborn care, um, four on general service readiness and uh, audits or death uh, reviews, and then for, uh, in which covered children's health, which we had not included in our assessment since that's not our area of, of expertise. What we did is uh, we did not collect data prospectively for this analysis. Instead, what we did is we um, used, the, uh, used data in the repository of the Center for Maternal and Newborn Health, coming from two different programs, one um, which ran in 10 countries, so that's nearly 1,000 facilities in Africa and in Asia of different levels, so both BMOC and CMOC facilities, data collected between 2012 and 2015 as part of um, a baseline facility assessment. So we've used tools, um, adapted tools from, from those um, produced by WHO, a, um, AMDD, uh, which covered uh, both service readiness as well as outcomes. And um, then we also used um, for, for one of the indicators, we used data that came from a study done post Ebola epidemic. Again, uh, similar tools 
uh, standardized but adapted to, to, the, to the actual work. What we did for the assessment is uh, for each of the indicators, we tried to identify um, data within our set that, uh, that would match the indicator where that was not uh, possible. We, we tried to use proxies. Then we extracted the data and then looked at the results. Um, so here what we're presenting is the availability of information per indicator. Um, and then as next step, we tried to assess the indicators with regard to the clarity of the actual indicator, the wording of it, but also the availability of data with, uh, within uh, the routine registers and, and facility records. And um, where, when necessary or where appropriate, we tried to make some suggestions in, ter in, in terms of how you could possibly make the um, indicator more feasible for use. So this uh, grid gives you an overview of that matrix of clarity versus availability of data. I don't necessarily want to go through all the details. Obviously, you can, you can read, uh, read through those in, in, in the actual uh, bulletin. But what is maybe interesting to, to note is that um, out of the 15 indicators we looked at, we've actually, so uh, 10 of those are clearly defined already, though only four are um, ready to be deployed as, as is at, at, at the moment. Um, we've got... Um, five indicators for which data are already available, and then um, the further 10 need maybe um, additional sources of information or certain tweaks to make them, uh, to make them usable. In terms of uh, then the, the major issues for indicators which were not clear and not ready to use, um, for the clarity and, and adapting of, of terminology, um, so there are examples such as use of uh, terms like prolonged labor, uh, which need to, needs to be unpacked. It doesn't kind of necessarily follow the same standards across the board. It is not necessarily used universally across. Sim similarly for severe systemic infection, terms such as operational, again, um, may be subject to, to some interpretation, um, and then use of stock out. So I know that last year there was um, a discussion um, led by the, by the WHO in terms of what stock outs actually mean, and I think the systematic review showed that there were 56 different um, definitions of, of the term. So obviously that's, that's, an, that's a recognized limitation, but one that also affects the, um, the indicators proposed for, for the quality of care assessment. In terms of time frame, so again, um, some of the indicators do say that within a specified time frame it would be useful to actually um, already specify this, uh, probably for things like um, so definitely for things like availability of drugs, but also for, for other indicators to make sure that the standard of measurement is the same um, across the board so you can make uh, comparisons more, more easily. In terms of information availability, so we've got some indicators um, whereby information is available but will not be inf available through routine records. You would need to go through patient records for those. So um, things around uh, measurement of, of blood pressure amongst uh, women coming for A and C visits, uh, but um, also for, for women being treated uh, for eclampsia with magnesium sulfate. But then there are others um, like um, the one on um, receiving oxytocin within a minute of, of birth. Now that's that's a very good indicator in terms of being very precise. Whether that's actually feasible to use in the, in the field is, is maybe a little bit more questionable. So um, again, something that, uh, that might require maybe slightly different, different um, sources of information such as observation or, or review of patient notes. Now some information is just generally not available immediately in the, in the routine record. So that uh, comprises um, essential elements of care for newborns, um, kangaroo care um, availability within facilities, and oxygen supply. So you would again need to maybe adapt some of the tools to, to be able to answer this. Now the, um, the limitation for that is that it's got resource implications. So again, um, the, 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 the balance between having a lot of information, information that is useful, um, but if, yes, if, if you need to adapt tools, if you need to start doing observations, it will cost more money. You would need more people to, to deploy those, um, those indicators. In terms of data availability, so where indicators were identified as available, generally our finding is that you will find information. So I think uh, in terms of non-availability, up to 10% of facilities across the different countries would have missing information, which is really um, somehow 
it shows gaps within a particular facility rather than a system as a whole, uh, with the exception of obstetric complications, which are notoriously difficult to capture through routine records. The registers rarely have specific columns that would capture this information. Instead, it will be added somewhere um, in the in the um, in the labour register. Uh, but that's the, the, probably the, the, the indicator which is most volatile, but it affects three of the indicators that we're actually trying to assess quality on. So it's an important one to make a note of in terms of missing information. Similarly for newborn deaths, um, information on weight categories not necessarily available uh, throughout. Um, maybe sort of that's an indicator that could be somewhat, somewhat simplified before it's de deployed. And um, also in terms of uh, sepsis, so women um, with, with, with sepsis, the indicator at the moment suggests that we should look also at readmissions, which again, a great idea and a kind of a, a great way of, of measuring um, quality of care, but linking records of women who might have been discharged and then coming back to the facilities is very difficult to capture on a, in the, through, through routine uh, um, assessments. And then there are also some country specific challenges. So in terms of stillbirths, countries like South Africa do not have records on uh, macerated versus fresh stillbirths. Everything is, uh, is combined together here. We're only trying to look at inter intrapartum. Um, and then uh, similarly for, kind of for other countries, there are gaps, so Asian countries, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, not necessarily best record keeping in terms of stillbirths. So in terms of the overall assessment, um, the, 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 the indicators that we've looked at, so the 15, um, that there are they're great in terms of the scale of the work, so they include um, input process and outcome indicators. They cover um, the, the, the critical elements of care which, which need to be included in terms of having a, te sort of an, a tester for, for, for assessing quality. Um, there is a mix of denominators, so some of the indicators cover individual patients, others go to facility level, others yet need to be extrapolated to districts, which is good on one hand because it gives you a mix of um, somehow perspectives, but at the, same time, at the same time, it makes it a little bit maybe uh, more challenging to make it standardized um, and then the, and therefore usable. And um, a point that um, in terms of kind of the different perspectives, um, that's only the care provision perspective that is included in, the indica in, in these indicators. So the overall conclusion is that further work um, to ensure the usability of, of indicators and quality is, is needed. However, the, the list of indicators proposed in, in 2013 and 2014 is, a, is actually is a very valuable contribution to get the discussions going, to um, start putting a framework together in order to be able to assess quality of care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. So I hope you're all holding on to your questions for the individual authors here. We're going to hear the last one in the series now, and then we'll take those questions. Claudia Hansen from the Karolinska Institute is going to present a meta-analysis of randomized control trial data on neonatal survival and community approaches to reducing that. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, giving me the opportunity to present our work. And, and I present you on behalf of my co-authors, for sure. And I would like to put it a little bit in the context now also what we heard before. So this paper is a little bit written with probably more of the same is not the right thing to do. So that's how we actually started to, uh, to, to, to think about and conceptualize this paper. And moreover, at the beginning, the title was actually what can community approaches actually help for weak health systems. So it became something a little bit different what it's now, but I think it has quite good messages. So we, so I was involved in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in a big trial uh, using a community approach with home visits to improve newborn health, which failed. And that was also one of our uh, point of departure. So we looked uh, a little bit through what has been published and uh, the background is that 2009 WHO said home visits uh, to, uh, for mothers in uh, in high uh, mortality uh, regions can, can reduce uh, neonatal mortality probably by something like 40%. So then there were quite a few meta-analysis done. Then there was our trial and also another trial which we, uh, which we identified and we did a new uh, meta-analysis. 
And what we did differently, uh, looking at Chile and trying to ask also the question why did our trial fail, is we sorted them by neonatal mortality and saw that there was an effect actually uh, when you looked at the trials, which we, can you continue? No, no, one more, yeah. So there was an effect if you looked at the trial which were really done in very high neonatal mortality setting of something like uh, uh, 25%. When it was lower, still high mortality, it was only 10%. And then when you go down and it, uh, the trials which were done in uh, neonatal mortality setting of be, uh, below 30, they had no effect at all anymore. So the next, next slide. Yeah. So then we also looked a little bit at the health system factors and we saw, we looked also what did these trials actually do? Not all trials actually reported whether they were able to improve uh, facility delivery, which is a key thing because you want to improve the, uh, uh, the uptake of care. And it's clear in settings where facility delivery was already high, these community approaches didn't do actually much. Then we also looked at the different contexts these trials took place and we realized that uh, one of the trials which was very effective in uh, reducing neonatal mortality had only two facilities per 100,000 uh, uh, population. The, our trial which failed had 17, so there was much more uptake of care already going on in our settings than in other settings. So we saw really a trend that these community approaches worked less, so in lower neonatal mortality, higher uptake of care, and uh, settings with a, with a actually better established uh, health system. The next one. So what does it have to do with measuring quality quality of care. So what's the implication now for measuring? So I think it's important to know what you, you, you have to know your context where you do what, what you want to do. And I would like to really strongly express that we have very different contexts and we have very rapidly changing environments. And I like this picture a lot, which is from a small uh, hospital in southern Tanzania. So I worked there 2001 and I came back to do the trial and this small facility had 500 deliveries in 2001 and had uh, more than 2,000 deliveries today. And access completely changed their mobile phones, their motorcycles, as you see here, a completely changed environment. And 80% of the women today deliver in, in facilities. So while, while we have been good now really to see, if you press one more, really to see how many women are coming, we have the demographic and health service, we really n know this, we have a pretty good idea. We also get better if you start with the readiness of facilities, we have the health provision assessments. But we are not really very clear about the clinical practice. What is really the effective care delivered? And we assume that our trial got really stuck in the health facility quality of care, so improving actually uh, that women are coming and that they bring their six children doesn't mean that mortality declines if the quality of care is not good enough. And quality of care is something really about giving the right woman the right child at the same, at the right time really the right measures, which is pretty difficult. Me as an obstetrician, I have been struggling for this to learn actually five years. So the next. So how can community actions now support the delivery and probably also the measurement of good quality of care? So I think these approaches which we have been looking at have much complemented actually weak health system. So the question is now can we design other ways which are more supportive, better strengthening and can improve some accountability. So we would see this as a way forward actually what community approaches which are really needed could do in the context of the weak health systems. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Claudia. The floor is now open, so who would like to um, have questions either about the conduct of this study, the results that the authors have shared with you here, uh, areas for future research or difficulty with, with indicators? Um, take your questions. Anthony, please. Good 
Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, just to comment on the last paper, because um, you meta-analysed a lot of the trials I was invi involved with. I'm <laughs> slightly confused as to why you would meta-analyse what's called community-based interventions. I mean, if I said to you, meta-analyse hospital-based interventions, you, you'd laugh at me because hospital-based interventions cover everything from surgery to medicine to pediatrics to obstetrics. Um, in the community, these were totally different kinds of interventions. One, you know, the women's groups were very largely working in rural, extremely remote, poor, deprived, marginalized populations with high mortality rates. And the mechanism of reduction of mortality was much more to do with changing behavior social support, and if it did affect choices about care, it was perhaps improving the selection of care at a time of a crisis where you're faced with very limited options. So I'm, I'm finding, um, I, I absolutely agree with some of your conclusions, by the way, about the importance of context, <laughs> but I, I don't see how you can meta-analyze such different interventions. Yeah. It Anyway, you're, you're fully right, and we have turned around this paper many times since thinking to write. So we have the criticism ourselves, so that's, <laughs> that's clear. But still, all of them actually wanted to improve certain healthy newborn behaviors, yeah, like breastfeeding, and they all wanted that women seek care. So in that, they were actually, so the pathway was on, so the, the approach was different, but the pathway, how they could affect neonatal mortality was probably not so different because all of them wanted to have more breastfeeding, less uh, 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 warmth care, not putting the baby in cold water. So they all wanted to achieve this and care seeking when the baby was, was sick. So the pathway was probably a similar thing, but the approach was different. And I also think in this, I even think that the, in, in, in the new context we have now, because I think it's really so much different than 10 years, 15 years ago. For me, it's, uh, I have been in, in places where I have been 15 years ago. It's a completely different situation. I, I assume that this accountability and the women approaches actually have more potential than really the, the home visits. Yeah, because they can now open up and actually support the support the health system. So I I agree. I agree fully <laughs> with your concern, and this paper actually drove me mad because I have done all this meta analysis at least 50 times. <laughs> Who's next? Yes, please. Very much for all the presentations. They were really stimulating, and I think it's unpacking an area uh, where much more needs to be done, as Margaret said. Um, many questions, I guess, but two to start with. Uh, Margaret, when you described uh, the variance you saw across uh, quality of care and systems, you then mentioned uh, zooming in on pre service training as a potential factor to say, might that explain some of this variation? Uh, when you looked at the systems that countries have, are you thinking also of looking at other drivers that may look at quality, such as incentives for performance, insurance? Could you speak a bit to that? And then uh, for the last presentation on the community interventions, you mentioned in um, settings with very high mortality, you could see a positive effect of, of home-based care. Um, could, you analyze, could you describe in more detail what was actually required to get that intervention on place? Was that done in a study context with all the support or had that dimensions that were more uh, comparable to routine health systems? Because where a system is weak and you put an intervention that's not supported, then that results that one may see in a study that is fully designed to kind of compare uh, the, the, the intervention with the control, that's, in, that's Effect may not be replicable. Mm -hmm. Margaret, would you like to start? And then Claudia on the next one. Thank you so much, Bernadette. You can see Bernadette is one of our commissioners and is getting right to the heart of the matter. Um, the 
it, absolutely. So pre-service education was one possible explanation for the very large country effects that we were seeing. But I think the broader point here is that there are factors above the clinic. That's really maybe the main point to make. Um, they're all baked into this word, you know, Uganda or Namibia or that, we, that we essentially use in the model as a stand-in for everything that's going on in the broader environment um, for these providers delivering care. So I think going down your list, absolutely. So pre-service education, but even before that, the selection of providers and the secondary education that they receive and are they ready to, to become a health professional um, is a, a harder perhaps and an and incredibly important issue. And then once they graduate, uh, what, is the, what is the payment environment, right? How is the motivation contributing to this, to this uh, uh, performance? Um, absolutely, insurance system. What about regulation and how, how do they feel? Do they feel the obligation really to, to do their very best? Because we do know they do less than they know. So absolutely all of those factors would be critical to examine. And the reason we were not able to is because actually there aren't good systematic measures of them that are available for us. And that's going to require much more in-depth studies within countries uh, rather than so much across countries. So thank you for that question. So I will add on a bit on the on the context. The first two, the, the papers mostly really reported on too little also on the context. They were all done quite program, uh, in programmatic context, so all in in in, in normal uh, health systems. Uh, um, and many of the differences between the health systems we actually couldn't analyze because this data are not available. So like, for example, health workers and how far is the service. But it was very clear if you looked a little bit more in detail that the trials which were done in lower neonatal mortality settings had higher healthy newborn behavior and that we also would expect. Yeah? They had higher breastfeeding, higher facility delivery, uh, better uh, warmth care. So, and then it's actually logic that the effect of, of uh, counseling the women better can't be high anymore because how, how, should it, how should it work? If you increase facility delivery by 5%, what should be the effect on neonatal mortality? It can't have. Yeah, because it's not, it's not logic. And that brings us back that we have to know this. And we do not have to, and we have to know it for certain settings because there are huge variations also in the countries. So not only in India, but even in Tanzania, you have a facility delivery between 30 and 90 percent. You have to know this. Yeah, and one approach of community might work in that setting, but might not work in the other one. And we, we don't have the measurement data for that. We cannot even, if, if development aid goes some, somewhere, they don't know what is right for that setting because the data are not there. Yeah, we have, them, we have something on the national level, but we have seen with the last, last paper also clearly at the sub-national level, at the facility level, the data are not there. There's a lot collected, but it's, it's I could now report for hours why it's not usable. <laughs> <laughs> You're learning off the hook. Yes, please, over here. All right, uh, thank you. I'm Andrew uh, from Malawi. I'm an interested party in the presentations. Congratulations, all the presenters. Uh, the question I have is uh, how can we translate all the recommendations and findings into action? Thank you. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go along. Left to right. Barbara, one of your findings translated into a recommendation, please, and we're going to ask every author to give us one. Thanks. Okay. So thank you. That's actually, yeah, it's not an easy question. It's not easy to be the first one to have to answer it. Um, in terms of the recommendation for the indicators, I think the work is already ongoing in terms of updating those because I, by all means we need to have measures that are standardized that can be usable in terms of action for actually changing quality. It's then persevering and measuring not only for the sake of measuring but actually doing something with the findings. So it's the whole quality of care loop. Um, that's probably not a very specific answer, but uh, in terms of the, the indicators, yes, they need to be updated and they need to be, um, so we need to have a set that would be usable across um, and at different levels. Okay, you got that? Update indicators, right? Um, okay, for, for these, um, Kenya, 
uh, measurement. Basically, the next step is what interventions to try in terms of behavioral change. For hand hygiene, that is the cornerstone of IPC, so I have been thinking already on some interventions to do with the government to try to test because that's the most important. It's not knowledge, it's not um, a supply, so how do we change that? So that's one, but there are other ones that you can think of there. Uh, the million dollar question, and I hope our, our, our second panel will actually um, get at exactly the heart of your question because there will be policymakers who will tell us um, some of their perspectives. But to me, it is the combination of two things passionate leadership in country, that doesn't come from research, that comes from something else. Um, and, but secondly, that passion and that commitment meeting relevant, timely research on topics that matter. I think that part is within the realm of the research community. Oh, sorry. Why do I, Finn, please tell us. No, uh, well, I, I'm not gonna give you the, the, the full answer, but I mean, uh, I might want to just make a reference back to somebody called uh, Keynes. He was a key economist. And when he was thinking about how do you influence policymaking, he did say, well, first of all, we engage. But he did also say that what goes on in policy mind, uh, policymakers' minds often reflects finding from previous research and academic insights. Maybe the link is not direct, but the link is there. So bringing evidence to the table, bringing evidence forward to policymakers in a clear and useful way is an important element in this process. And I would say that that's sort of part of what we are trying, both with this issue, but also, of course, with the policy relevant work that is carried out at country level. Thank you. Okay, over to Claudia. What, uh, I'm not sure if was any question still addressed to me? I'm not yeah. sure. The question Sorry. is for each author, what is one implication, hmm? one action from your findings, one implication of your findings? So are you suggesting that community approaches should no longer be funded once countries reach a certain development level? <laughs> They're not going to have any effect? I think they, we should we should rethink the role. Yeah. So accountability, yes. Yeah. But just supporting and preaching facility delivery when facility delivery is 90% and the quality of care is crap doesn't help anything. <laughs> here, here. All right. Over to Graham. Our last one. So uh, from our work, I think the main recommendations were that. Measuring quality of care is important, and we have presented an overall essential care at birth index, but if people are interested to look specifically at newborn care or obstetric care, they can also do that, so the index can be disaggregated into different domains. So we are advocating that there is more measurements, a systematic measurement effort, including in the private sector, which provides a substantial uh, market share of maternity services, and um, there should also be further investigation into the high prevalence of unqualified attendance, working, providing institutional services. So what we found is um, in the public sector, because human resource uh, shortages are so immense, doctors are not available, they tend to rely on unqualified personnel in the public sector. But whereas in the private sector, um, they're much cheaper to hire than, say, you know, hiring a qualified nurse or, and you just hire them, train them on the job, so they're much cheaper. So there needs to be further work looking at why unqualified personnel are being used. And lastly, I think um, we need quality improvement initiatives in hospitals um, on a large scale and link those to functioning accountability mechanisms. So those are the three. And, and can, I, can I just add something? So, um, so I, me, me as an obst obstetrician, I, I always think there's really a huge danger with this facility delivery if the care really is not good. We had the highest ever maternal mortality in French and uh, 
uh, and a few other European hospitals some 200 years ago. We don't have them that high in, in, in the low-income settings. That was because of all this issue of sepsis. So if, if hospitals don't provide good antisepsis techniques, they actually could kill mothers instead of helping mothers and babies. And that's my, my really big concern. So and we have done a lot with really getting the women now in, and that's nice, but it's, it's more or less now really our safety obligation to, to get this now also really safe. Otherwise, we are doing the opposite of what we, what we really want, and I'm there we're always a little bit worried. Yeah? Crap is maybe a little bit too harsh, yeah? but I'm really worried as an obstetrician. <laughs> And worried because of the over, so of the sepsis and also using too much interventions and influencing too much delivery care also then uh, in a way which is, is not really helpful for the mothers and the babies. Thank you. So, hello. So I just have um, a comment, a question really, a bit of a reflection, maybe especially for Margaret and Gaurav, but it's really for anyone who's been working with an index. So I came along here thinking measuring quality of care, I'm going to hear lots of geeky presentations about psychometric properties of indices and all that stuff, which has a lot of baggage attached to it, and I haven't heard anything about it at all. So I just wondered if you had any reflections on that. I'm quite happy not to have heard of you, but, but actually then maybe there are some issues there that are quite serious about measure, measuring things and what do they mean? Uh, sure, I can start and, and go up. Um, well, Joanna, be careful what you ask for. Uh, we can certainly uh, <laughs> delve into that as well. Yeah, you know, we've spent a lot of time thinking about this, this issue, which is really how do you aggregate quality as a multidimensional construct? So let's start with that. I, we, I said this, many of us have said this. Uh, many pieces matter, right? And we get it, glimpses of it really coming forward. Uh, so in our group um, at Harvard and, and within the commission, we're actually spending a fair amount of time thinking about the psychometric uh, properties. And we've examined different ways of combining, because really the key question is how do you combine these indicators into a whole? You know, principal component analysis, which ones matter? Is it, you know, how, how do we weight them? What's more important? Um, and I have to say, having explored, and this is a very partial answer, and it's about these particular obs observed care elements, so this may not hold for every indicator in the book. Um, but one thing we're finding is um, that uh, it's actually pretty simple additive methods do a, a very good job and are very clear, and I think this is about also important, and to Andrew's point, the clarity of explanation and being able to say, what is it we're doing? There's no hocus pocus, we're doing the following. The one thing we are thinking hard about in, in the group is um, obviously, there are sometimes many more kind of microscopic um, actions that um, sometimes accrue in a history taking, right? Whereas there are fewer available physical uh, exam items. And so, to the extent that both history and physical are important, um, sometimes what we're doing is we're, we're taking averages across those elements rather than weight, you know, because if you don't do that, then of course the, the item with the most elements wins in terms of its weight. So we sometimes are doing equal weighting of the components of care uh, based on the um, basic medical notion that good medical practice requires uh, completion of, of steps of care. That's about the only adjustment I would say that we're making, but I've seen others do um, you know, much more, and we've tried and don't find it illuminates. Gaurav, I think, wanted to say something in the um, thin sure. and So, I, I mean, we had, a lot of, we had a lot of data, so we thought carefully about how to make sense of all of this, and for the 42 practices, we essentially map them, uh, so for the 42 mm -hmm. items, we map them onto clinical practices, so based on their um, logic, clinical logic, as well as purpose. So, for example, for, let's say, something like active management of third stage of labor, so if everything was done, only then were they given a one. Otherwise, they were all given a zero. Whereas some other indicators, so for example, monitoring, uh, uh, regular monitoring of pathograph use, that was a single indicator, versus uh, some of them were um, composite indicators. I mean, I know other people that have kind of undertaken Delphi-type methods or used even advanced modeling and all of that, but we tried to keep it very transparent so that you know, people could use it as it is. And we said, at the very minimum, these are 
the essential practices that must be done for every case. So we've tried to keep it quite simple. But um, obviously, I think, um, although it's useful to communicate a large amount of information, when used for quality improvement purposes, people will need to really look deeply into what is driving the index. So for example, let's say skin-to-skin -skin care might be really poor, which brings the entire newborn care index down. Or uh, respectful maternity care might be poor, which is bringing the obstetric care index down. So I think it will be important to um, look at, uh, you know, which specific components. And further, I mean, why does, uh, why does a particular thing happen? So for example, if uh, rates of active management are uh, poor, is it because injections are not available, or is it because of training? Is it, um, uh, you know, what, what is the issue? So it's like, so although they're useful to communicate in a concise way, I think there's lots of limitations. Thank you very much. I mean, th th that is obviously a, an extremely important uh, topic. Uh, let me just reflect not specifically with, with reference to the health sector, but, but, but more broadly within the development field. I think one of the uh, key lessons that is emerging uh, is, uh, first of all, the clarity and transparency in both the definition and the use of indices um, is an area that requires uh, more focus, more attention than it has in the past. There's been a tendency to put forward um, interesting, um, fascinating indices, uh, just to sort of provoke the debate. Did you know that the multidimensional poverty index used by the UNDP does not adhere to the Declaration of Human Rights, that is actually not respecting the fundamental rules of the game according to that? So, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that as researchers, as policymakers, we really need to try to insist on clarity that we do understand what goes into a particular index and we actually understand what are the assumptions lying behind. Now that would often lead to simpler measures, uh, uh, simpler, more transparent indices, and then in all cases make absolutely sure that they are unpacked that you do try to think about robustness, that you do try to think about what the individual elements of a particular index actually is doing. And then finally, <clears throat> there are methods being developed now where instead of relying on indices that you can think about how the whole distribution is actually moving. This is uh, an area that's called first order dominance, but there is actually work there that can push our insights uh, forward, which do not depend on the exact weighting uh, of, of, of specific indices. Thanks. Yes, just a quick point to build on that, because I think uh, Senator Margaret's points on, on weightings always come through, and I'm glad uh, it's been brought up, although probably better that it wasn't sort of a feature of our own uh, discussions here. Yeah, as someone who spent a lot of time on, on indices, both in the U.S. and then on for work at WHO, um, we are working, there's continuing work in a number of different areas. There's, uh, there's a tension between um, colleagues of which I sort of would consider myself um, from, from the data side who look at these indices and sort of roll their eyes because everyone knows just based on the points uh, with Finn's uh, comments on new science uh, accepting, however you weight it, countries will end up as first on the list or 13th on the list or 15th on the list or communities or whatever the group is. Um, and, but um, for instance, when, I, when we did the first U.S. national health care reports, I sat in the back of the room while my boss presented my work. That's a strong tradition in big bureaucracies. Um, and um, the sort of the, the committee staffers were there and some of the representatives and Senate people were there. And they would hold the book out there and um, they would flip, 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 stop at a map, flip, 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 stop at a map, flip, 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 stop. So they were looking at these composite pieces we put together for the states based on state uh, sort of how they were doing on prevention or how they were doing. So they matter because they grab, you can sum up very complex things and you get people's attention. But immediately you need to explain then to say, well, here's the reason why. And personally, I think if we could move more, particularly in the quality field, 
because one of the issues we also have on the data side with indices is that often these studies we're looking at specific populations, so that's one solution to it. But often when you're talking about bigger groups or policymakers, they're concerned with different groups of populations. And right there, the statisticians' heads explode because you've got elderly people in, that you're trying to put in one index with perhaps care for newborns, and it just doesn't work. And so for me, one of the things I think we should move more on is this whole idea of how, what's the rate of travel? How are we improving and, and rate of improvement and percent improvement? And in there, you can start looking across different measures and how quickly uh, things are, are improving. So personally, that would be my, we had to come, with, uh, come up with one index in the future that we measured it would be um, how improving on things. It's on a subject you'd approve of. Um, could you just explain the Uganda findings being 30% better and the appalling Indian findings on quality of care by simply the quality of training of midwives? Because it just strikes me that Uganda has probably got better qualified midwives. That's why this is just a hypothesis. And we know that in India there is no midwifery cadre. And that auxiliary nurse midwives, most of them, when they are passed out and given their certificate of training, have never actually delivered a baby. And this is some new stuff that's emerging and actually we're working with the ministry and with others at the moment to see if we can come up with some solutions to this to try and develop midwifery within India, which is a major issue because one of the major obstacles are other cadres of health workers that actually obstetricians and nurses are not that keen on having a separate cadre of properly trained midwives, which doesn't seem to be a, a, a common thing in, uh, in Uttar Pradesh. And finally, WHO needs to get its act together because the definition of an SBA is all over the place. And everyone is calling, I think on your data, you'd probably classify the doctor, the nurse, and the A&M as an SBA. But actually, most of them don't have it. I, I think I'm an SBA. <laughs> you know, I'm qualified, I'm a doctor, I've actually done lots of deliveries. I'd be a disaster at a delivery. <laughs> so, so Anthony, a quick, a quick response and then Gaurava. It, a great question, and I was just referring back to our table four in the paper where we show that for antenatal care, compared to a nurse uh, or midwife, physicians had 8% lower performance, actually, um, and nursing assistants 3% lower. So this is now adjusting for all the country variables. What would be very interesting to see how those nurses and midwives performed in, say, Uganda, where the training might be better. But these are precisely the kinds of conversations that need to be happening. We need to be looking at the structures, the basics. I think, uh, no, I, I completely agree. Uh, that's, that was one of the reasons that we decided to use the term qualified versus unqualified, because we didn't really assess the competencies uh, but I know, like, Japaigo did a study recently where they looked at the training curriculum of auxiliary nurse midwives and said they don't fulfill the, you know, all the 21 competencies outlined there. I think, I mean, in addition to measuring who an SBA is, I think there's not much research on the enabling environment for SBAs, which is the main issue. So I think... Uh, maybe in measurement efforts, trying to measure the enabling environment at health facilities rather than, I mean, and focusing on the content of care rather than, you know, is it a doctor or a um, TBA or whatever. That's okay, one last comment from Claudia and then we're going to have coffee. <laughs> I just would like to make two comments. First, with Emma, the. <laughs> midwifery and why it is important. So I, I'm also always, when I'm, I'm teaching, I'm saying just look at the two books from WHO, the Integrated Management of Childhood Diseases and the Integrated Management of Pregnancy and Childbirth. The childhood is big like this, the pregnancy is big like this. So you can't do it as an in-service training. You cannot 
put it on lowly trained health workers. The second point is the, um, is the retention of, 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 of practices. Most of the nurse midwives are uh, rotated every half a year. So even if they are a little bit getting into it, after half a year they go to urologist or where, wherever because it's not a protected cadre. If we would have midwifery, we also would have a protected cadre which stays in the maternity. We're going to take a coffee break and come back at 10 past, please. Coffee's outside. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Yeah. Very lively. Uh, we will be um, discussing some of the critical issues around uh, measuring quality that have been raised in the last um, uh, session. Um, as you may have already seen in the editorial, uh, this issue highlighted one of the reasons for the lack of data of quality of healthcare services in low-middle income countries uh, was this emphasis during the MDG era that Margaret mentioned on coverage rather than the challenge of uh, providing high quality services. Uh, and then as highlighted by the authors earlier and presented in places where studies have been done, these quality measures that currently exist and used have their own limitations. Um, some are not sufficiently validated to be recommended for use. In other low middle income countries, for various reasons, measurements of qualities were not done consistently and, and therefore in such cases were not able to generalize the findings bef beyond the study settings and compare these findings for other sessions. So what we want to do in this next session is to give our presenters an opportunity to comment um, specifically on the validity and the pr practicality of some of their studies. So we'll pose two questions. Um, what do they think are the main challenges with measuring quality of care? And what do they see are the greatest gaps with measuring quality of care? Since we don't have a lot of time, they don't need to answer both, they can pick one. And, and be able to uh, and comment. Um, we'll give about a few minutes, about three, four minutes, five minutes for comments, and then we open it up for discussion. So we have, again, our authors for this panel. Um, I'll start in the same order. <laughs> okay, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. I have chosen the question, what are the greatest gaps uh, with measuring quality of care? Uh, I'm going to focus on two main ones. The first one uh, for me is a tools data gap. Uh, in my specific example, uh, we chose or we uh, built on tools that were already developed, validated by the WHO, and they are available uh, in their webpage and also in the CDC's webpage. And uh, we were very surprised that there was no data even for a few health facilities in Kenya and in many countries in Africa. Some of the data that was available was like one decade or 15 years ago. So it was, it was very difficult to find, you know, like uh, information about what the status was. So I think one of the things, even though we need more data and more different type of data, we are not even uh, we haven't caught up even in terms of for the tools that are existing, having like basic data from countries, especially in low and, and middle income countries. Um, Nobody knew, for instance, that you know uh, the um, compliance with a new uh, syringes and needles was 100%. When we presented these results in the government, they were happy, but it was a shock. People couldn't, like for two minutes, they couldn't talk, <laughs> right? Like you, I couldn't follow for, for, two, for, for two minutes. Uh, the other thing is measuring, for instance, knowledge and practice and supplies at the, same, at the same time gave the government a lot of thought because, of course, you know, like the first thing that you think is like we have to train healthcare workers and that wasn't the main constraint. So it allows you also to focus more on what is the next intervention or what is the next thing that you would like to test. Um, and another example is that our main intervention is uh, inspections of health facilities in Kenya. So we have two different treatment arms. 
And when the government was designing the new regulations for actually for, random, for the random control trial, they had no information on how the health facilities in the country or even a subsample would face or would, uh, would be scoring according to these regulations. So we did a pilot and based on that, they actually defined that they, were, they couldn't close all the health facilities because 97% of them didn't comply with the minimum. So they changed the regulation so to give people the health facilities to improve in a year. So that's the power of data that actually is not there. And my second gap is the link to outcome gap. And again, the main uh, issue that we have found is that um, it's very difficult to determine what matters the most, even in, in this checklist that I was telling you about it. When they were trying to put uh, warnings and sanctions into this new regulation, they just decided to put an equal score into each of the 300 items because there is not a lot of evidence and they didn't dare to actually put more scores here and there. So there is very little evidence in a lot of these uh, indicators that we are testing, how, what is, how strong is the link to the outcomes to see which ones matter the most. In the example that I show in the paper, for instance, it's 2% of, of hand hygiene, but does that matter more, is that more important or is equally important that is in the examination or in the lab or the injection room or in other settings of the health facility? Is that more important than other you know, waste segregation when we cannot actually follow? So try to understand where to put more weight because that will define in a setting that is very constrained in terms of resources. It's very difficult to go into, to the government and say, focus on these 500 items equally. And we could have more information and again, we try to find evidence. We couldn't find a lot of uh, evidence that allows to actually link all these indicators to outcome. So, sir, me too. Okay, uh, next would be Claudia. Uh, great, thank you, uh, Kiddis. You asked first about challenges. Um, I think they fall into two categories, the what should we be measuring and secondly, how are we measuring it? Um, I think on the what, there are legitimate questions about what elements of quality matter. We said there are very many elements. Um, I don't think there is sufficient clarity. We even saw it when the papers were submitted for this special issue. There are many people doing many things, some of which are peripherally related to quality. It's difficult to say something is completely unrelated to quality, actually, because it's such a large uh, construct. Um, but, but some clarity about common definitions. I like the points I think uh, were made several times about even for very narrow sounding indicators, there's just not agreement on how are we supposed to be measuring that. Um, so I think what to measure matters at the micro level, having the same definition for, for indicators. But I would even say at the kind of deeper level, like where should we be investing our resources in, in measurement? Measurement is expensive, it's hard uh, to do. So of the thousand things that we can identify that are related to quality, which 10, 27, should we be measuring? And one pitch I will put forward, and this is work that's ongoing, is that while inputs are important um, to, to quality, for sure you need stethoscopes and medicines, they are not themselves actually very descriptive of the quality of care that people receive. Um, and so one push for what matters is further along the continuum toward what actually happens to people in the care um, context and also their outcomes. So that, that's my vote for what. Um, in terms of how, I think we have a couple of uh, uh, problems that, that we're seeing. One is survey crowding. I think we keep complaining there's not enough data, but I actually see uh, in some ways the opposite. There is a multiplicity of surveys. When I, sit, when I, I think from the outside, sometimes it seems like, oh, there's not a lot going on or data sets are not available that we could look at in the way that every, for example, wealthy country looks at its, its own data. Those data sets are public and people can, can, uh, can examine them. That doesn't happen as much. It's improving. Uh, for some of the surveys, health facility surveys, for example, and others. But when you actually sit down with a health ministry official in charge of data, they, they say, oh yeah, we've done 10 surveys of facilities in our last, in the last five years. I'm thinking about our friends and colleagues in Ethiopia, and I know we're going to have the former minister with us, but I mean, that is a data-rich country. The service provision assessment was done, a very large one, including a census of facilities just a few years ago. A gigantic census of uh, basic emergency obstetric care was just done, a new spa is going to the field. And I think that's maybe an ex extreme example, but there's a lot of surveys. Now the flip side of that is that often the only people who know the results are the people who wrote the report. Mm -hmm. And I do not see a direct link between many of these surveys and action. 
Uh, in fact, I don't see reports uh, and strategies citing these surveys, even though they may be very well done and nationally representative. So there's a big disconnect, and a lot of what I'm thinking of is dormant data uh, in countries. So on the gaps, um, I think there are a couple of gaps. Uh, I want to emphasize, I think there are many, but I want to emphasize two. Uh, one is the people's voice, the user voice in this entire enterprise. You know, my entire research career did not start with assessing health system quality. It actually started by asking people, why do you or do you not want to use the health system? I was interested in utilization and I was interested in people's preferences because I was struck by the very different levels of utilization of essential services in sub-Saharan Africa. So working closely with colleagues there over the past decade, it became clear that quality was a driving force in people's decisions. And so now we're shifting our attention to understanding, okay, well, what quality are people getting? But I'm not forgetting the user. I think what's really incredibly important is understanding people's experience. I think the maternal health community has really grabbed this agenda with respectful care and measuring that and developing ways to think about that. Um, but also um, the outcomes of care that matter to people, I already mentioned this before, patient reported outcomes, um, perceived quality. What do people think about the competence of this provider? Because we may or may not agree that they can tell all the elements. Of course, they cannot uh, in every case. But it's certainly their perception certainly will drive what they do, right? So knowing that perception is important. And by the way, that is linked with another complete gap, which is understanding what is the demand for quality in any one setting. Um, I think one, many of you will be familiar with the observation that many people are sus suspiciously satisfied with care that some of us, I think, would probably many of us in the room would consider completely terrible uh, in many countries. Why aren't satisfaction ratings so high, 90%, 85%, 94%? You know, um, and, and of course, social desirability bias in surveys, people wanting to be nice and kind are all the driving things. But another factor might be that there's actually, frankly, just a very low expectation that people have. And as we think about this issue of, of improving quality, it seems impossible to move that mountain without people demanding better care. And so thinking about demand um, generation in the population for better care, just like we drove demand for utilization, right? Um, is absolutely critical uh, as a gap. Um, and I think uh, I, the other final gap to mention is that, uh, and this relates, uh, Joanna, to your question about how do we aggregate things, is um, it's one thing to understand how, how, how people fare for a particular need or service, but for the Ministry of Health, they're often more interested in how is my primary care system performing or how are my hospitals performing, is referral working? So rather than taking a disease-by-disease disease view or condition-by-condition, condition, we're interested in a system um, assessment of quality. Is the system performing as it should? And I think that's still going to require quite some thinking about what's the right set of things that convey a system quality uh, uh, performance. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. I would like to add on a, on, I, I agree with all what, what has been said and these are the, no, uh, the known challenges. I would like to put now the health worker as a key person which has not been put in the center of quality of care, but these are the ones actually providing the quality of care. And we need, with the data we collect, we also need to trust the health worker like we have done actually in the, in the high income countries. When a health worker uh, reports active management of labor is done within a minute, then we cannot come, ah, we better do observation to check whether it was really done in one minute, yeah? So I think I find this ridiculous. So we have to trust them really to some extent because these are the people in the end really providing the quality of care and we have to listen also to, to what they say. We have done a qualitative study and the health worker said it's all like rain. Sometimes we get supervision, sometimes not. Sometimes we have drugs, sometimes not. So that is also not a, a good environment for really uh, providing, providing quality, quality of care. So this is a, this is a challenge. The other gap which I see is that we have been underutilizing a health management information system. So we have a lot of surveys, they are somewhere, they're even not on repository, so districts can't use them, districts don't know what is there, whereas the health management information system is actually in their hand, but it, not in a way that they can easily actually um, 
use them. And it's also very difficult to use them for, for more comparison. I just had a PhD student who tried from Cambodia, and it took a whole month to compile from three provinces data over, over two years. This cannot be. So they must be somehow readily available, readily like you have it actually with the demographic and health survey. So we have to rethink uh, with our uh, technology we have, how can we utilize health management information system to drive quality of care? I think, I mean, um, so much has already been said, but just to add to what Margaret was saying, I think linking information from different sources, different data sets that are already available, for example, I mean, um, data from clinical observations with EMOC assessments or um, service provision assessment results and actually seeing what is being done or um, um, that is important. And also I think it's, um, it's useful to try and get as much data as possible. So for example, there is uh, some evidence that provider effort is the key determinant which determines like quality of care. So information on their motivation or the incentives uh, that exist or management structures within the facility, I think uh, getting that sort of information is also um, quite important. Apart from that, I think, um, uh, I think having a strong research team locally who knows the, um, in that community and ensuring that a high quality training program is given to the research assistants is very important because some of these concepts, so for example, around respectful care or other things, you know, you um, uh, really need to pay um, emphasis um, to these things. And like observations are a, are a good method, but they also have many limitations by themselves. And there are also many other methods to assess uh, processes of care. But I think um, one thing uh, to keep in mind is um, the possibility of any observer bias or Hawthorne effects that can occur. And if you plan for these things from the start, if you, um, um, if you uh, I mean, make sure that you can order the observations by the time that they started by every individual research, uh, researcher, you can kind of account for all of these things. So I think those are some of the challenges. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I think I'd, I'd like to echo a lot of the um, comments that have already been made, but just maybe to add to the, um, to the discussion on challenges in measuring quality of care. So um, as I mean, as already has been mentioned, the topic itself is really broad. So looking at the example of the um, special edition of the bulletin, I mean, the, the diversity of topics covered is broad. Therefore, kind of, it's quite difficult to, to maybe find um, ways of, of capturing things um, in, a, in a uniform um, matter. So, one of the aspects is the multiplicity of stakeholders involved in the work. So at global level, you, you want to have uh, trace markers of uh, quality that will be applicable throughout. The lower down you go in terms of facilities, there are many more that, that are important and need to be measured and uh, reviewed locally to improve the quality of, um, at, at the level of the facility. In terms of um, the user perspective, so that's, um, that's kind of somehow almost a different type of discussion in terms of what Margaret has already alluded to in terms of what people's ex expectations are, which sometimes are dictated by uh, lack of experience and kind of, um, but sometimes it's kind of its cultural aspects as well, where um, you don't challenge what you receive. Obviously, the, having some sort of care is better than not having any care, which then links to, to benchmarking. What kind of, how do you define quality? Is receiving any sort of, sort of care an improvement on no care? Of course, you want to strive for the best, but kind of then you also need to take the limitations of whatever is available on the ground as a limitation of the kind of the level of quality you can aim for. And then the big issue is um, is really around uh, data. So we've, um, I think, kind of um, the, 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 it's, it's, it's nothing new to kind of to say that there are quality issues in terms of data available within the facilities to help measure things. Um, but it's also an issue about timing, so sometimes uh, so data should be recorded um, at the time, but by the time they are available, very often they're out of date. So again, it's already been mentioned, the context changes very rapidly, things change very fast. So how do you actually tap into it in 
so, so sufficient quickly to be able to act and actually improve quality. In terms of source of information, so um, um, with, within kind of our work, we've, uh, we've looked at facility information. So the registers and records do not cover everything that would be relevant. The systems that are um, used, like the HMIS, um, will not cover all of the aspects of quality that are important and should somehow be measured. Um, but then there's um, then the issue of the alternative uh, sources of information, like exit interviews, like uh, observations, which I've already mentioned in my presentation, have further kind of cost and resource implications which need to be taken into consideration. But that's a challenge for measuring um, quality. But then another issue is the difference between the records that you will come across um, and what the reality actually is. So uh, there are... Um, so the poor recording systems is maybe one um, aspect, but there's also the sometimes deliberate action um, on, on behalf of the people capturing the information who are under pressure or for kind of alternative reasons, um, put in information that isn't necessarily uh, reflecting of, uh, of what is happening. So um, the, um, maybe kind of by now a standard example is uh, filling of paragraphs post-delivery because you need to meet certain number, so kind of the, the, the quality standards you're trying to fill. But filling a paragraph once the baby is out doesn't help anybody apart from maybe um, the record keeping um, staff. Um, but then also the fact that um, if kind of the quality improvement really is based on a punitive system. So if something goes wrong, the only thing uh, you'll get is scolding from your supervisors, from people from the district level. Chances are you maybe uh, you will want, not want to share information. If you don't want to share negative outcomes, chances are you will not be able to improve it because then nobody realizes exactly how, how big an issue um, is. And then the final point maybe in terms of uh, linking of, um, of um, coverage and, and then kind of measuring quality versus outcomes. So um, the high rates of, um, of coverage we've already discussed, doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean um, that the quality will improve. So an example here would be the WHO multi-country survey on maternal newborn health from 2013, where out of the 29 countries um, assessed, the, 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 the ones with the highest coverage rate for essential care were also the ones with highest mortality. So, there is obviously kind of a quality gap, but how you tap into this, again, maybe it's not so clear. So kind of, again, uh, the safe childbirth data analysis, which again shows that coverage is, is improved. Adherence to essential practices during childbirth is actually improved if you look at the standards being followed, but the outcomes don't necessarily follow this. So then the question is, how do you tap into it? So these are sort of some, I, I, I hope kind of, um, um, Again, not kind of to paint too, too bad a picture of, of where things are, because obviously uh, it's a complex issue. It's one that requires discussions. It requires kind of uh, coming up with some sort of consensus on how you measure it, but uh, challenges exist. And um, I think kind of it's an exciting challenge to have to maybe try to input into how to, how to um, overcome them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think our um, panelists have touched upon many things, availability, lack of data, quality of the actual data, uh, linking and measuring, uh, linking them to measuring, uh, to measuring outcomes, um, how to increase demand, um, how to make the data relevant for policymakers with aggregation, so many things. So uh, we can open up now. We have about 20 minutes for questions and comments, so if you can just um, say who you are, because we have remote users, so use the, speak, the microphone and um, comments, questions, general. Yes, yes. Oops, sorry, small intervention. I know there are people in this room with tremendous expertise, actually, in this area, uh, not only the authors here, but I just wonder, I just to really encourage comments and your own uh, perspective, please. Okay, I mean, th thanks a lot for some uh, extremely insightful uh, observations. Um, maybe I can try and provoke just a little bit. I, I'll, I'll be sort of a little bit dented. Uh, it doesn't mean that I don't um, appreciate a lot of the uh, progress that has been made. But when I, as an economist, try to look at a lot of the uh, data or the, a lot of the surveys and a lot of the dormant information that's there, um, I can't use it. Um, take Guinea-Bissau as an example. I have a very good friend, medical doctor, who's collected information for a long time, and he said, there's this fantastic database, but there was no information of economic, social, and so on variables in that fantastic data set. 
So when he came and said to me, can't we collaborate? I said, well, I would, be, I would be happy to. But what it would take is that I would have to start from scratch. Because I need, in order to generate answers to a lot of the kinds of questions we're discussing, I need to have the economic, social, and other variables in the data sets. There are, of course, some data sets that do have that. But I would like to submit that uh, a lot of the information that's out there doesn't have it. So maybe one of the challenges that I can see is how to somehow um, get some communication around that and, if you wish, maybe clean up a bit um, and try to ask the question up front, what is actually required in order for the various surveys to respond to the actual questions that you want answers to? Because it seems to me um, that that's not happening right now. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I wanted to just uh, follow up on a, a couple of uh, uh, issues, and Gaurav raised this, uh, Margaret, when he challenged you a little bit about the um, uh, observation method, which seems to be the dominant method that was used uh, in the surveys. I think what we heard from the Liverpool group was uh, how few actual indicators are available for use at the front line uh, that relate to quality. And I want to go back to Andrew's question, which is, what's the practical value of all of this measurement? I think it's enormously important uh, that you have exposed, the, through all of these uh, papers, the state of quality. But dynamic improvement is going to require real-time data. And there were none of the papers. The closest that it came was the paper from Ethiopia. But even there, it was a survey um, that was a team went in uh, every few months to spend three days on site. That's just not real life for the frontline providers who are going to be expected to be at the front line of improving care. So I think there's a huge gap uh, that is revealed by the lack of uh, good tools uh, to measure quality at the front line. Um, and I, I'd just be interested to know uh, the thoughts of the, the panel on, on how we're going to solve that problem because uh, if you combine the lack of, of uh, available indicators uh, that, that reflect uh, real issues around quality, the, the complete absence of any measurement of, of patient experience, um, we have just a giant way to go uh, in, in, in trying to bring real-time measurement uh, to bear, which is what's going to be required for real-time improvement. I mean, anybody can comment uh, on it, but I, I thought that it might uh, create some reaction, and that was what I was hoping for. <laughs> the, um, the different measures on the front line and the timing, et cetera, so we, we faced this, a similar problem when we were uh, designing our impact evaluation in Kenya. And when the government wanted only to measure this checklist, and we were like, but what if those are not the set ones that matter, right? So now we are collecting data with cover, inform, cover uh, standardized patients, with direct observation with this one. We are trying to uh, have like a wider uh, set of tools to measure with the idea that later we can also say, okay, what are the ones that were highest correlated with the ones that are closest to a patient? We are measuring also patient experience. But with the idea that it's a big story, but try to understand what are the key things where we can uh, contribute somewhat to understand what are the key tools that the government could measure with more frequency, lower costs, et cetera. But it's a big question. We have very little data on that that connects us is comprehensive and representative. So the idea is that is the whole census of three different states, so hopefully we can contribute somewhat to that later. 
I think we do not need surveys, for example, to assess whether a health facility has all the things which it needs to provide quality of care. So we can ask the nurses to report this once a month, and in most countries actually they do it, only that nobody notices this. It's just lying, lying there. And then I also feel one can maybe look at innovative ways also. We can, we can have nurse mid, midwife registers and they say, I did that many deliveries and I got this many in-service training and uh, I have done this and this and this is my uh, key, uh, key challenge so that they are maybe re-registered every year. So we, we can think of a little bit something out of, out of the normal box of doing surveys which might then be much more sustainable. Quickly, um, since maybe is data linkage a way for like this economic, you know, having economic data and one database and if it hasn't been structured from the beginning, haven't thought about that will also create problems. So I'm just a prompt. Uh, so uh, on the, I think, e economic data and the absolutely critical need to understand what quality costs, what facilities are spending, how are in resources invested, actually generating or not generating quality care. I think there has been um, much more work, for example, and, and, and even that hasn't been sufficient in understanding uh, whether resources are you know, correlated with volumes in terms of productivity assessment. I think what we are saying this needs to move to is not productivity in terms of patient seen, but in terms of patients treated well and patients getting better. And those, the linkage is absolutely critical because countries we're talking about in this room primarily are, have incredibly constrained budgets. They can't do everything that we're measuring and would love to do. So, the, so this is an absolutely critical linkage. To, to be very concrete, for example, in some of the service provision assessment surveys or SARA surveys, there are basic, basic economic factors completely missing. So actually half our surveys don't reveal whether the facility is urban or rural. That kind of matters. You know, um, and another one is that we don't know anything about the wealth of the neighborhood or the or the, the the context in which it's in. We do that by doing data linkage, with combining data that were themselves highly imputed to try to figure out whether the facility is operating in a resource-rich or a very resource-poor neighborhood. These these things obviously matter. These are the very things, Bernadette and others, that are above the level of the clinic that actually make a massive difference to what's going on there. None of that's captured right now, and it doesn't all have to be in one survey, but if it isn't, then there has to be a clear way to bring those variables in. And I think on the second uh, point about, uh, Pierre, your point about what are these surveys contributing given the need for real-time um, data, I don't think, this, it, 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 it's interesting, right? You're getting lamppost bias here a little bit. The data that we have are, are, are what we have and what we obviously, what was featured in this, in this issue. And that has to this point been coming and the best quality data have been coming from nationally represented, these nationally represented facility surveys, is that the only source of data that's relevant? Absolutely not. What we want to start with, with all data actually, is asking what's it for? <laughs> Who is it for? And I've already highlighted, um, and I think others uh, nodded uh, vigorously, that actually most of these surveys are not even used in country. So what, what's the point? I do actually think that uh, the measurement, the minimum measurement package around quality has to include facility surveys much leaner than the current version as a way of tracking quality across the country from Ministry of Health to know where is it moving to see whether people are, are getting the care they should be getting, including some mix of these, of these tools. Some of them can be simplified and, and made more efficient, including using cell phones to reach patients, getting patient voice in. But the piece you're emphasizing is what's HMIS doing for us? What are other methods doing for us? And I can tell you, just look at this quality issue they're under delivering in terms of comparable, robust data right now. And that has to be a, an urgent point of action. Can I just um, oh. add something? So um, w one thing that I just wanted to highlight, and Dr. Matthews is also here, I know that, <laughs> sorry, I know that like the ENAP group is doing a very big validation study on indicators around the um, time of birth, including for um, sick babies. Maybe you want to say something, Dr. Mantis? I think 12,000 12, births across multiple, oh, okay, okay. But I think th their results will also be, their results will also be very useful to, you know, have the, which, indi let us know which indicators are the valid ones, which can be 
integrated into the HMI system and so on. So. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm Teresa Diaz. I'm I took over for Matthew's position, coordinator for monitoring evaluation epidemiology in the MCA department. Um, there's a lot going on with routine systems and um, and and specifically with DHIS2 getting not only interoperability but apps that uh, that provide uh, printouts and and analyses and so forth. But there's still this problem with with aggregate uh, data. And I think, and I really always say this, I think we have to have a strong voice about individual patient records. I think that it, you can't provide quality of care without individual patient records. As a clinician myself, if I don't know what happened the last visit, how can I provide quality of care the next visit? And being able to have those individual patient records in a routine system, you would have a lot more information than you have now. And being able to have these more routine kind of reports, these more electronic kind of reports for the you know the clinician for the district, not making them do the kind of uh, analysis, I think would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Samira from the Department of Maternal and Newborn Child Health. Mine is a comment around the challenge. I think. This came up as I saw ex-Minister of Health from Ethiopia walking in. The key challenge is really getting the commitment and leadership from the policymaker at the country level. If the policymaker makes it his priority, then I think measurement of quality would be a standard procedure for any programming. So perhaps the next session will highlight issues around it, how do we make that ownership and commitment happen at the country level, then if we have that, then all the tools and whatever comes with it will make sense because data is for policy making and decision making. Thank you. Thank you. That's front for the next session. Okay, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, Ramesh Krishnamurti. I work at uh, uh, WHO HQ here. Um, I just one observation for the last uh, 10 years of visiting many, many health facilities for doing the HMIS work that Teresa was mentioning as well as um, structured data. What we have noticed is that <clears throat> there is a serious lack of structured data at the level of care at the, at the inpatient registries. The inpatient registries are highly unstructured and sometimes completely incomplete, if you will. Uh, and whereas the out, out, outpatient data is more of a quality issue than inpatient data. Inpatient data at least contains many of the transactions that are happening at the bedside, but in, insofar as aggregation is concerned, it is not well done. And outpatient data quality is a very, very serious issue in many countries. And in those countries where we have found where outpatient data, the, the throughput determines the quality. So. Um, uh, just to give you a case in point, we visited uh, several facilities where the throughput is 3,000 patients per day, and the quality is extremely low because the doctors have no time to enter the outpatient records. So uh, we have to kind of really understand what is going on in the, in the health workforce space that I think there was a comment made, and also the structured data space as to what is minimum that that doctors need to collect. What is minimum, not what's maximum, because they need to care for the patient more so than recording the event. So how do we do that, this transaction cost uh, allocation model in, in which where the minimum of the minimum amount of data is, is being structured? So if countries get that kind of a guidance, I think it would become a, a very important uh, uh, game changer. Thanks. Okay, now? Yes, my name is Jonas Gonset. I'm an advisor in quality in WHO America in Washington. And this is just a comment building on comments by Dr. Tarp. Because I think that the final objective is improving. So having data to improve something. And the comment is that quality of care 
and we are saying care is what finally happens to the patient. And there is, there is, there is such a big level of heterogeneity of situations that I would think that somehow Dr. Tapp was uh, opening the space to think about quality in health services and systems. But we have to address economic components, but also stewardship, governance components that really affect and will be probably the, the components that might make a change and that we can use. So it's only open in that space. I was really uh, impacted when I read the, the name of the bulletin, quality of care. But in order to improve quality of care, we need so many things at the health systems and health level, uh, health services level. So that's only that. Thank you. This follows well on the last comment. My name is Rima Jolove. I'm from the Maternal Health Task Force at the Harvard School of Public Health and also help to coordinate the Ending Preventable Maternal Mortality Working Group. And we've just completed a long process to develop a set of indicators for, as Margaret has mentioned and others have talked about, those things that are above the facility level but that are really conditions that are necessary for quality of care. And we went through a process to map, identify, prioritize, and evaluate for quality the um, uh, available indicators for things like adequate resource allocation and health system strength. And even would it be helpful to have a standard set of disaggregators for those social and economic uh, uh, cont contextual things for all indicators for which that makes sense. So um, I think the question is how to make that work usable and diffuse down to the point of service um, because I think those things are enablers for, for quality of care. Hello, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Timitai Urbubu. I'm Director of Advocacy for MSD for Mothers, which is a pharmaceutical uh, company, and it's our commitment uh, towards maternal health, uh, improving maternal health. Um, my question is really, uh, it seems that basically there's a lot of practical um, things that need to be done here. To what extent have we actually thought about the role of private sector in terms of filling some of these gaps? Um, and so like, for example, you mentioned uh, uh, challenges around collecting data, um, uh, uh, use of mobile technology within facilities, um, having management and information systems for healthcare workers. And these are things that basically the private sector um, do and have tools and, uh, and expertise in. Um, just wondering what, to what extent has that been considered? Cheers. Uh, yeah, that's excellent. Observation, is this something somebody wants to address now, but we can also raise it during the um, second panel at the country implementation and the role of private sector working in the countries, unless anybody would like to. Okay. We'll make a note and we'll be sure to bring it up in the next session. Okay. Thank you very much. And I don't, I guess I would like to keep the schedule. We're moving on to the next panel. Uh, okay.
want to make sure all our names are up. Okay. So this is the session you've been waiting for. Um, the evidence is well and good, um, and data are exciting to some of us. But really what I think is very clear to everyone is that evidence is just one input into the, the more important process, which is the one of creating change uh, and creating improvement for real people in real countries every day. Um, and so I couldn't be happier to have with me some of the leaders from uh, four countries actually of quality and health systems to reflect on the challenges that they're facing in both improving quality for, for people, but actually interacting with these sorts of data, with the evidence that's out there, um, the, the, the problems, the, um, the successes as well. Um, so um, I, I do think this is going to be, frankly, the most stimulating and exciting session. The way we're going to do this is I'm going to ask, introduce them, and then ask each of them a question one by one, and then really open it up to all of you to ask them questions. Um, okay, so first of all, with us we have today Quality uh, Directorate Leads from Liberia, Indonesia, and Mexico, along with the former Minister of Health from Ethiopia. We'll, we'll introduce them one by one in a moment. Um, and I, I understand that uh, uh, our colleague from Liberia raced here from the airport, so he deserves extra credit uh, for the, the huge effort he made to be with us today. Um, so they've traveled from long and far, uh, and I think we're all going to be very eager to hear what they have to say. Um, so actually, if you don't mind, perhaps I could, I could start with you, if that's okay? Sure. Great. Okay. So this is uh, Dr. Philip Bema, who is the healthcare, uh, healthcare Quality Management Unit um, Head, the Ministry of Health of Liberia. Um, we all know Liberia. It's an incredibly famous place now. For those who didn't know it a few years ago, everyone knows it now. And that's because you faced one of the most horrific epidemics in recent memory, uh, and that was the Ebola crisis, of course, in the last couple of years. Uh, it's really, I think, highlighted many, many things for many of us, and it's going to be studied for years to come. It's already resulted in a great deal of introspection, both in Liberia, but also globally, looking at the global response. But many people are claiming that the health system is really the first line of defense um, against um, outbreaks. And Yet we see a proliferation of people thinking about um, pandemic preparedness on the one hand, um, and this emerging notion of resilient health systems, health systems that can vent, adapt, deal when something uh, difficult comes along, a shock comes along. Here in this meeting, though, we've been talking about quality of care as one key component of healthcare uh, performance. Can you help us think about the links between resilience, health system <coughs> resilience on the one hand, and high quality health systems on the other hand. How do those things connect? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, that's a very important question and I'm so happy to share the Liberia's experience in the room. Um, no doubt the Ebola outbreak in West Africa exposed a lot of things. And so when we talk about resilient health system and quality, uh, to be honest, quality is the very backbone of resilient health system. Now, why do I say so? Um, before the, the Ebola crisis in 2014, um, Liberia has been emerging um, from um, a kind of 14 years devastating civil crisis. In 2006, we had a, a general elections and we're trying to rebuild the health system. So before 2014, actually there was a health system in place, but the quality of the health system was never measured, was never tested, and so Ebola kind of exposed that in a very big way. What we saw during the Ebola outbreak was that the, the system was, was completely dysfunctional. This, there was a system there, but the system could not withstand the shock that came as a result of Ebola. And that kind of helped us to see that there's a reason to concentrate on quality because if you see the, the cost associated with responding to the Ebola crisis, and you see what we should use to put into strengthening quality across the spectrum in low-income countries, you'll see that it's, it's just huge. And I like the way the discussion has been unfolding this morning, kind of looking at the economic part of quality. But if we just look at what Ebola did in West Africa and quality, you see that sometimes if we don't really invest in quality, 
then we can pay the bigger price. So when the Ebola crisis hit, we kind of ask ourselves, do we have a resilient health system in place? Those critical questions kind of help us to see that really we didn't have that in place. Because when we took stock of ourselves to see what we had in place, we noticed that there were some key critical gaps associated with quality. For example, infrastructure. We cannot talk about quality and when there's no infra health infrastructure in place. Um, the SARA report that you just talked about, the SARA was performing in Liberia. Majority of the healthcare facilities do not have adequate water system in place. So we can't talk about quality if you don't have water system in place, you don't have waste management system in place, you don't have infection prevention control system in place. So health infrastructure was completely poor. The other area that kind of highlighted the gap was the issue of uh, health human resource. In Liberia, um, because it's a low income country, um, we, we don't have many doctors. And the doctors that we have in the countries tend to be skewed more towards the urban areas because in the rural areas you don't have a lot of facilities, you don't have internet connections, you don't have uh, telephone coverage, you don't have uh, a scratch card, you don't have many other things. So majority of the healthcare workers tend to be skewed towards the urban area. So the rural areas are left completely vulnerable. The other thing that the Ebola crisis highlighted was the issue of supply chain. So in life, we, we, to be honest, we cannot talk about quality if we don't have adequate drugs or the appropriate drugs to treat infections and malaria. So in Liberia, there's a more like a push system rather than a system that is working. So um, that kind of highlighted a, a, a critical gap. The other issue that we have was the issue of health system strengthening. What do I mean? The whole issue of quality culture is done in Liberia. Um, quality tends to be abstract. So when you talk to policymakers, you talk to decision makers about quality, they are like, what are you talking about? Here we talk about quantity first before quality because a lot of people do not have access to health services. Then you're talking about quality. So the whole issue of quality tends to be abstract in their mind. So prioritizing quality is a major issue. So just a kind of reflection from the Ebola outbreak, the Ministry of Health decided to do a deliberate effort of setting up a quality management unit that look at quality across the spectrum. Thank you very much uh, for, for those comments. And, and, and it was very heartening to hear you say that the quality is really the, the heart of a resilient health system. I certainly think that's how people um, think of it as well, uh, in terms of trust, for example, and confidence. Um, thank you very much. To my right is uh, Dr. Sebastian Garcia Saiso, who is the um, who is in the quality of healthcare and education. Um, so he doesn't just have one sector to worry about, but really two. I don't know how he does it. Uh, in the Ministry of Health um, of Mexico. And obviously Mexico is such an interesting place for so many reasons, bo both because epidemiologically you're dealing with a range of, of, of challenges, uh, still some maternal child health challenges in parts of the country, and yet throughout the country also an explosion in non-communicable disease, particularly diabetes, that was featured in, in the special issue, uh, which I think was declared a national emergency, I believe, um, very recently. And so, I think, and also, by the way, I should say, Mexico is a leader in health system measurement and in quality measurement. And, you know, when we were talking over at the coffee break, the first thing I asked him is, you got to tell us what not to do in measurement before we all make the same, uh, same efforts and invest the same resources that don't always pay off. So I think that's an important insight. But the question I have for you right now is, we care about diabetes. We want those people to do well, similarly for hypertension. But as a health system person, as a health system leader, how do you combine the sort of disease focus, the focus on these population groups with an overall performance of, of um, the health system in terms of its, its quality uh, um, of care? Thanks. Thanks, Margaret. Um, well, to begin with, yes, it's a complicated agenda to have two different areas, uh, quality of health care that has prospective quality and also regulatory quality of health care, and then education, which is has to do with training every single health uh, professional in the country and linking universities with uh, provision of services. So it's a complicated agenda, but uh, I'll try my best to actually answer your also complicated uh, question. Um, uh, basically, the, um, Mexico has been uh, moving towards universal health coverage since uh, 
17 years now. Uh, at the end of the 90s, we did a, a national survey, a survey that showed that 50% of our population, which was back then roughly 50, 50, 50 million, had access to social security and healthcare through social security in a a pure Bismarckian model of social security. But then 50% of the population didn't have access to anything. Um, so we decided to launch back in 2003 a comprehensive insurance scheme based on general taxation called Seguro Popular. And since then we've, we've sort of moved towards having this universal health coverage perspective and that's when it gets complicated when, when it's not a matter of financing but a matter of how you transform your system, your system to provide universal coverage and not just financing everyone within a country to access healthcare. And so this has been the latest struggle on, 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 on a point in which we now have uh, roughly 100% of our population covered in terms of financial resources to, for healthcare, but then we don't necessarily have the results that we expected from that. So we've increased about five times the available budget since 2000 uh, to the time, but then we haven't improved five times in terms of results. Um, We've, we've developed a series of strategies since uh, the launch of Seguro Popular to measure and monitor quality of healthcare. One of those is a national system for, for uh, quality, so a set of indicators called INDICAS. If you Google INDICAS in capitals, uh, you, might, you might get through it. And, and in there we have uh, over 12,000 medical units, facilities, reporting every quadrimester, quadrimester in terms of PREMS, so what, what patients say of the care they're, they're doing, and then, and then also some medical auditing in terms of what the health records are actually expressing in terms of whether they're fulfilling the things that they should be doing. And there's a big challenge with this, because one thing is to have a system and then having units reporting, and then the other is for them to understand that the system is for them for improvement at the local level. So we got to a point uh, roughly five years ago in which everything was green. Everyone was very happy, everything was being done according to the plans, everything was working. And then in terms of quality, if you have everything green, then you have a problem. Because then there is this lack of recognition of the need to improve. And so we decided to change the system, so we've been working together with OECD, um, I, IHI, to basically transform this and link some more objective or hard measured uh, data in terms of, for example, uh, clinical results and, and outpatient services and in-hospital results from care to this, to this uh, soft self-reported uh, instruments. And then the result is amazing. Suddenly you start realizing that you do have problems, that there is a lot of room to improve and units are starting to realize this again uh, some, some years after they, they reported everything was okay. Um, so every quadrimester we also survey about a million people on what they refer as experience with care and this, this gives us a lot of information because you see for example in, in, in places where you have less educated population, particularly indigenous population, then expectations are really low and we understand that. So they're very happy with any care they, they receive at all and then this changes as, as you go into urban more developed areas of the country. So we have to deal with how do you design specific elements to measure quality of care within this particularly heterogeneous context. So now focusing on your question and, and how and how we are we are targeting a particular condition. So diabetes is a very complex problem in Mexico. It has to do with lifestyles and our genetic uh, predisposition to diabetes. And it has to do also with with the lack of access that we refer to in, in the first place, and access has to do with also timely access to healthcare, and the other one, the lack of results from people actually accessing this system. So if you have 13 million people diagnosed with diabetes or estimated uh, diagnosed with diabetes as we have, then you have a massive problem if you're not actually dealing with the disease. And then that reflects also in the, in the very large incidence of uh, chronic kidney disease, for example. 
and the cost that this represents, of course. So what we're trying to do is focusing on seven priorities. So we have a national quality strategy that includes all the indicators for everything, it includes many of the general actions in terms of uh, patient safety improvement mechanisms, the overall uh, quality management program, but we also target seven particular conditions that are a priority in our country. So diabetes and metabolic syndrome is one of them, of course. Um, acute myocardial infarction, in which we have three times uh, uh, more uh, mortality, in-hospital mortality, than in, uh, the average in OECD countries. So it's a big problem and, and also linked to our um, epidemiological transition. Breast cancer, cervical cancer, acute lymphoblastic leukemia in pediatric population, and mental health with um, emphasis in um, in depression. So this prioritization, what allows us to do is to actually uh, uh, have a stronger approach and, and more tools to actually bring down this national strategy, very comprehensive and, and, and probably idealistic strategy, into very specific things that need to be done at the local setting by administrators, by planners, by clinicians, by all the different actors involved in quality of care. And in, in diabetes, it, it, it links different things in terms of one following procedure, so making sure that everyone knows what they have to do, two, actually giving them tools to train on these procedures and knowing what to do. So we, we've created massive online open courses for staff in general different conditions. We've created algorithms for this, and they're online and available any time for everyone. And we've also developed specific tools for planners and administrators to make sure that they understand that if a certain drug is not available every time at a clinic, this might have a problem for the quality of care for that particular patient not receiving this medication at that point. Um, so all these Prioritization, what it allows us to do as well is to generate something that we've called externalities at the uh, facility center. So basically, even though it's linked for diabetes or acute, uh, uh, acute lymphoblastic le uh, leukemia or acute myocardial infraction, by targeting a specific facility by a specific topic and training personnel there, it might change the whole, the whole spectrum of conditions seen there. So, for example, in hospitals for acute um, myocardial infraction, if a patient comes with an acute abdomen, it'll benefit as well because people have been trained in triage, people have been trained in how to access uh, acute cl clinical care immediately. Um, and allows us to basically show results in a better way, um, which is also a good thing in the system. Um, I don't know if I've actually answered at all your question, but um, <laughs> I'm trying to say too many things, and I'm too jet-lagged to actually realize what I've said. Um, yes, would that be okay? That seems good to me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so I, I'm picking up, a, I think, a, f a few important themes that are resonating with some of the conversation of, of earlier today. Um, what I, I do find it fascinating that you're in charge of both um, the healthcare quality and the quality of training of health professionals, which you know is directly related to this to this issue of how good are the providers when they get to clinic um, actually, and are they prepared to deal with the disease burden that they will be seeing every day? So it's interesting to see in Mexico the combination of those roles in inside the ministry. Um, number one, number two. I'm fascinated by this idea of a general sort of quality infrastructure infrastructure for both data gathering and, and tracking, but also for improvement um, that you were describing, uh, you know, that data that are available to facilities, for example, to see on a regular quarterly basis, perhaps. Um, and also the, 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 I think, frankness with which you said it doesn't always work the first time, that the indicators, you know, are all green, that's meaningless. Um, and, and linking that also to the low demand for care that we've already discussed among some populations. And so, therefore, the need to improve. So I really like the dynamism element that you brought out. And I think the, the, the other thing you're pointing to is, look, you've got this data and improvement infrastructure, but sometimes you need a turbo boost for those conditions that are really killing people, that are really causing suffering, the high burden conditions. In your case, you have a list, uh, including diabetes. And then what do we do for them specifically to really dramatically improve, not to wait another 10 or 15 years, but to dramatically change care today? So I think that's a really interesting framing, right? Having a strong base and then having intensive efforts perhaps where needed. So thank you. All right, I that's want to- exactly what I said. 
That's what you said. <laughs> exactly. He's very near me, so I can even hear his thoughts. Okay. Uh, so I want to next introduce uh, Dr. Eka Viora from the Director General of Health Services, the Ministry of Health of Indonesia. She's traveled very far. Again, we're <laughs> delighted to have her with us today. You know that um, in the issue, we have had many articles on particularly maternal and child health care, but also an attempt to make linkages between those services and a broader universal health service package, universal health care package. We heard about this in Mexico as well. Um, and Indonesia is a very big and very complicated country. Mm -hmm. Thousands of islands, thousands of municipalities, real geographic barriers, so many challenges and many fronts. Um, I wonder if you could comment um, as you're pushing towards universal health coverage, as you're pushing toward um, uh, helping uh, establish a minimum package. Um, I think often we talk about minimum packages, we talk about benefit packages, but I wonder what you might say about what minimum quality of care are people also going to be able to demand or expect when they, uh, when, when they move towards universal health coverage, and how easy, difficult, what are the challenges in making that consistent, that quality of care consistent across a, a highly diverse and heterogeneous country like Indonesia? Thank you, Chair. Thank you for this, uh, this opportunity. Uh, I share to the, our perspective for the uh, quality of care related to maternal, newborn, and child health. Uh, maternal mortality ratio in Indonesia is still high. It is not achieved as MDG's target, and now is brought to the SDG, SDG's target. As you mentioned, Indonesia is the world's largest archipelago. We have uh, more than uh, nearly 70,000 islands across the equator, with over almost 250 million population, uh, multi-ethnic population, and also it is the Union Republic with decentralizing administration, and consists of 34 provinces and uh, 514 uh, district and uh, cities. Uh, yeah, uh, health is a state is in, integral part of the national development to reach uh, healthy Indonesia through three strategy in the current five-year plan 2015-2019. The strategies cover national health insurance to reach uh, universal health coverage in 2019, and the second, health infrastructure improvement, and the third, uh, health pro paradigm expansion, expansion through healthy family-based approach. Challenges are faced in the element of a health system that includes of issue, availability, uh, and readiness, readiness of quality of healthcare infrastructure, infrastructure, particularly in the remote area. Uh, for the uh, quality improvement of maternal uh, and child health in my country, quality improvement in maternal child health care start with the, firstly, uh, we are development the national guideline on integrated antenatal care as the service standard. It is consists uh, of uh, 10 steps, discover, waging, blood pressure, uh, check, nutritional status, examination of uterine fundus, uh, fetal heartbeat, tetanus toxoid injection, ferrosulfat uh, tablet, laboratory test, case management, and counseling. And secondly, came to the dissemination of the national guideline to sub-national level for, uh, to the uh, provincial and district uh, health office through technical consultation meeting, training of trainer, and various technical assistant. And the thirdly, assessment of quality implementation, which is done through field supervision, monitoring, and evaluation. Sub-national level then send periodically report of implementation status combined with assessment on the progress of maternal and child health quality improvement issue and proposal uh, solution. And the fourthly, the national level respond to the assessment report that include adjustment and input for refinement of strategy related to the quality improvement. However, 
the result of the quality improvement performance varies among areas and among province and district. This is due to the variation of uh, decentralization stages, capacity of health worker, and constraint in fulfilling health facility standard, particularly in remote area, including in adequate budget support from the local government. As regard to the MCH quality improvement experience, we learn uh, that skill attendance of meaningless compared to the compliant to follow basic procedure and performing life-saving skill, and second, measurement of quality of care is expensive. It has to be linked to integrated training and accreditation approach for the hospital and for the primary health care. Professional society need to be the guardian quality. They have to be engaged properly. All these issues should be solved interdisciplinary, intersectoral, and interstakeholder collaboration, including public-private partnership and engagement of the local community. A national committee on quality improvement of healthcare as part of the health system should be the priority step to plan comprehensive action of quality improvement in the country. Currently, the national program priority 2015-2019 for health services, this development aims to increase access and quality through healthcare availability and readiness, particularly in the uh, remote area. As happened in the uh, MCH example, evidence are required to move forward with quality improvement action. This includes various researchers and study to provide profile of quality status and review of the current progress as input for quality adjustment. We also need lesson learned and the best practices from more advanced countries with many experience in quality management of healthcare services as part of the uh, health system. Thank you very much, Dr. Viora. I think your, uh, your comments really highlight the uh, essential nature of having a wide set of constituents behind this agenda. That it isn't just for the Ministry of Health to say this is important, but you, you mentioned professional associations, patient groups, uh, uh, facility managers, and others. And I think that's a point that perhaps hasn't been highlighted quite as, quite as much. How many actors need to be in the mix? It takes a community, a country, really, to, to make this happen. So thank you for emphasizing that and the complexity of, of, of making those communities then work together. Um, I want to move to uh, Dr. Kasete Birhan Admasu, who is the former Minister of Health of Ethiopia between 2012 and 2016. Um, and as a former health minister of a very large and also very complex country with diverse populations, and many health challenges, I'm sure he has many things he could share with us today. Uh, but I, I would love to hear about your lessons learned, Dr. Cassette, around policymakers and what is it that they need to do to act? Um, what um, also stops them from action? Sometimes maybe they have the, the will, but, but it's difficult to act. Uh, can you explain to us what motivates action, what stops action? And then on the other side, Side. What can researchers in the academic community, uh, think tanks, and, and the broader community do to make the research and the data more relevant to policymakers? Um, what don't you know that you wish researchers will give you answers to, for example? And how should they be interacting too with, with ministries of health? Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. Although this has little to do with the Rollback Malaria Partnership and the advocacy, but I am uh, very glad that I have taken part uh, in this forum. Uh, very simple questions to a very easy problem. Huh? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, I can tell you from my experience and from my interactions with uh, my former colleagues that quality is an important agenda for leaders. So I, you find no minister who doesn't care about quality um, in Africa or elsewhere. The reason is simple, because we have a lot of pressure when you go to parliament, when you open the radio or TV or have interaction with people, 
you always hear not compliments. Even a very effective service delivery platform, uh, you hear always complaints on the quality and so on. So I would say there is a general consensus on, its, on the need to improve quality. So there is no need to go out and convince that quality is an important agenda. Everybody understands quality is an important agenda. But the problem starts when you start to think how you would like to influence policy. As uh, some of you might have noticed in, in my observation of a health system and the medical practice elsewhere, including my own country, you know, when something is established as a culture, it's always difficult to change it. If, whether it is right or not, whether it is an effective way of doing business or not, our system is always difficult to change. So I think it will be critical. And this, this has always been my point of view, and that's what we have started you know, to do in Ethiopia. We need a revolution to bring quality. Uh, maybe we like in Ethiopia the word revolution, but what does revolution mean? You know, it's a fundamental change in the way you think, in the way you deliver, and in the way your system is organized. So without this kind of fundamental change, it will be very difficult to change the conversation about quality. So changing the culture, attitude, behavior of the health providers is going to be critical. And I also agree that we really need to invest in communities so, so that, you know, while you put all the initiatives and systems and practices to change the way health providers act and behave and do in terms of meeting the service standards we have, but at the same time, you really need to empower communities to demand quality service. You know, in Ethiopia, for instance, with our <coughs> famous health extension program, we have been investing to generate demand. But we have not used that same platform to empower the communities to demand better service, to demand quality service at the facility level. So I think you know, a revolution happens when you put pressure from bottom, you know, the bottom up as well as uh, top down. That's one. The second, you know, for a successful rollout of quality initiatives, we you need to build an implementation capacity, um, meaning you need to have the infrastructure, the quality infrastructure in place. Um, I mean, in, in the developed economies and health systems, you have quality management officers looking at the data and, you know, there's a care provided to individual cares. In many of our economies in the developing world, we are moving toward this, you know, some sort of health insurance or financial protection system. So it is about time to build that infrastructure where you have people in each facility, in each you know, level of management structure, people who really need to think about quality. So you know, if you come to my office and present to me um, you know, how beautiful and successful a small quality improvement project is, the question I would ask is, has it really changed the behavior at the facility, or is it by providing unsustainable financial incentives that you manage to deliver those results. So without really creating that, you know, nucleus of, you know, system that can really bring transformational change or revolution within a health facility, it will be very difficult to, to bring impact. So it's not about the data. It's not about you know, the reporting systems and so on. It's about individual providers meeting the service standards. Everywhere you go, there are service standards formulated based on WHO or other you know, normative agencies. 
So it, the, the challenge is meetings was a standard. So you need that implementation capacity, that infrastructure, that nucleus at each level of the system that can continuously look at and provide you know, the inputs to bring transformational change at, at each level of the system. You need you know, the human resource. I totally agree with, with our colleague from Mexico that you know, the providers need to be skilled. If they are not skilled, it, you know, the quality will be compromised. So we need to think about the skill of the, the, the health workers as well. So that kind of implementation capacity has to also be integral part of this, this system. Supply chain is a big problem. So if you may have skilled workers, you may have the, the right kind of systems and processes in place, but if the products are not, there, you know, JSI has this motto, if no product, no service, no program. So uh, I think it's really important to look at that as well and try to address those uh, bottlenecks. And finally, you need the structure, the structure of looking at, you know, these quality issues both vertically as well as diagonally across all programs and across all service delivery platforms. And that's how I, I, I believe quite the quality agenda could be, could be addressed by having a holistic, transformational and revolutionary thinking. Without that, small, little improvements wouldn't really take us far. And that's how the, converse, the conversation should be formulated as well. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, you spoke about many things and many levels of the system from the community and on all the way to the minister's office, actually. Um, I think, I, again, one theme that, that I'm hearing is that, and it's interesting, it's a bit of a tension, right? You're speaking uh, a lot about culture, standards, almost the air uh, that we breathe in these clinics, and the, the way, the expectations that should be being fulfilled. And these are things far above a specific indicator that might be collected about what was done. You're also speaking about sustainability. I think culture, changing culture is the only way to sustain something meaningfully was the implication. And I think that's an interesting and productive tension, actually, because the indicators are serving one set of purposes. But what I'm hearing you say is we don't work to the indicators. We work to a greater purpose, a, a, a changed culture, a changed level of performance, not just, uh, not just an incremental uh, shift. And so I think that's an interesting issue for all of us, those of us focusing more on the measurement side. How do we get at the measures of some of those deeper, um, deeper elements that, that you're asking us to, to talk about? So thank you uh, for all of those uh, wonderful presentations. Um, what I would like to do now is open it up to, to questions. Um, I know there's already one question from the audience about the role of the, of the private sector in all of these discussions in, in your health systems and what can they do to to promote quality, how do we ensure and regulate them also to and to uh, work together? Uh, so, I, but that's one question. Let me take two other. We'll take three questions at a time, please. Yes, in the back, and please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is um, Anya Smith. I'm from Stellenbosch University in South Africa, and we've just completed a series of standardized patient studies on TB, hypertension, and contraception. And something that really struck me while we were designing the instruments was the big gap between the guidelines that are issued in terms of quality and the on-the-ground realities. Mm -hmm. Because I think going through all the, the guidelines um, for a contraception consultation would take 40 to 45 minutes. The reality is the nurse has five to 10 minutes. So I think my question to the panelists is, is there a, a big gap between international but also country level thinking around the policies and guidelines that determine quality and the on the ground realities? And do we need to become much more focused in thinking about quality and what quality means? Thank you. Thank you. Other hands? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, Isabel Vexmuth from uh, Service Delivery and uh, Safety Sorry, Department. You're, you're, would you mind just repeating your um, cutting up? <laughs> Isabel Vexmuth from uh, Service Delivery and Safety oh, Department. Uh, I have a question for Mexico, in fact. Um, I am a little bit astonished because you have not mentioned, you know, 
social determinants uh, of health, you know, and how, what, what are the actions of Mexico, you know, to tackle the root cause of the problem, specifically of diabetes, you know, and I have not seen as well multisectorial, you know, approach mm -hmm. in the way you have described, you know, how you address quality. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's very disease-oriented, uh, disease you know, approach. What about health promotion? What about salutogenesis, you know, approach? Uh, specifically, for example, in the, in the area of patient safety, not do harm, we, we discuss as well to change this model, not disease-oriented approach, but, you know, salutogenesis model. So what the country do? in the reality about that, you know, and I am interested to know more about Mexico and what they do. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We'll just, we'll, we'll get some answers and we'll come back to you, Anthony. You're on the list. No, not now. Okay. Um, all right. So the three questions were, there is a question about the role of the private sector and how we work with the private sector. That's one. That's for anyone who would like to speak. Um, um, the, the question around guidelines and the reality testing of guidelines, do they really, um, can, they, can be, they even be done, is I think what you're asking in, in real settings. And I think the last question had a few different elements, but one of the things I think is uh, thinking about the, the, the disease versus a, a more patient-centered or preventive model, but also the multi-sectoral piece I heard you uh, really asking about. Ministry of Health is one thing, but what about all the other sectors that are implicated in the generation of disease? So maybe since uh, we, we can start with that one, since it's very specific. Yes, thanks. Um, well, I had five minutes to say about pretty much everything I could. So yes, of course, I didn't go into detail. Um, in terms of diabetes, there is, there is a national strategy, and it has to do with, with not just not even just health, it has to do with education, it has to do with social development, it has to do with many different aspects and social determinants of overweight, obesity, and diabetes. So it's not just diabetes. And, and quality measurement and quality policy has to do with all these different aspects that are happening in the country. So it has to do with work with uh, educational authorities at the local level, so it's schools, and, and, and particularly primary schools. So um, just to go into detail with this, we're, we're just launching a national program to measure every single child in between the first grade and sixth grade uh, and, and working with them to do um, uh, activity uh, related, uh, I don't know, uh, programs within schools and see whether we have a results within one year and repeating this every year. So this, this includes roughly about, um, I think it's, it's something like 10 million children in the country. So the entire population that it's within schools. So all this, all this is online, so I can give you much more details on this uh, and, and how we're actually doing all this to tackle this. Now, in terms of, of the, whether to go general or disease specific, I think it's a combination, and, and I think I said it, maybe, maybe not as clear, but we do have a national quality strategy which is not linked to any particular condition. For example, patient safety is one of our basic concerns, and it is not oriented to any specific condition. Now, the problem that we have, and, and, and I'm very glad to be here at WHO, is how to actually link general priorities with vertical programs that address very specific particular diseases. So when you have that context and you apply that into local context, which could be a country or it could be a local facility within a community, it becomes very complicated because you, then you rely on the same provider of services to do everything. So they have to report to the TB program, they have to report to the chronic disease program, they have to receive the uh, vector-borne uh, disease program, and they have to do all the quality of care. When, when, if you think about this, quality is at the center of all this. You cannot improve in one condition if you don't do the overall picture of this. So this, this complicated context um, that comes all the way from WHO and, of course, is replicated throughout all our national and local um, um, resource allocation programs. Um, it's trying to link now to, to quality of healthcare. So, for example, if you talk about diabetes, and if you're trying to prioritize diabetes within the chronic disease spectrum, then quality of healthcare has to be there. And the same with these other seven, seven priorities that were established based on our burden of disease. And 
Now, the other consideration of this is if we prioritize, once you have the overall quality standard and overall quality policy, if you prioritize, this enables you to show results to the local community and empower them to actually follow and continue doing these things. And as I was mentioning, and probably I wasn't very clear, this also has externalities or in, indirect effects within the facility. So if you improve myocardial infection attention uh, care within hospital, it will also improve indirectly the quality of care received by a patient come with pancreatitis or an acute abdomen syndrome. Why? Because people have been training on, on triage mechanisms, because they've been trained on how to do a fast diagnostic, because resources are available for the emergency services, because administrators are sensible on what to do at every specific moment. So that's what we're trying to do. Show results on very, uh, these seven priorities and then trying to make this basically sum up to our national quality strategy. Thank you. I'm just aware of the time, in fact, uh, that it is very short and a number of you are heading off to other meetings in just about 13 minutes or so. Um, so I actually wonder, Dr. Costello, you did have an outstanding question. Would you add it to the mix and then we'll let the rest of the panelists comment on the remaining questions, please. Um, Mine's a very generic question about, since you're all in power, of, of power relations in relation to quality, uh, perhaps starting with the complexity of international donors and agencies who come in with tyrannical experts and lots of money and fragmentation to try and drive you in particular directions, or the power or not of professional associations like whether nurses and midwives have a voice, how you can actually mm -hmm. empower some of your frontline workers. And finally, a really difficult one, which is we're trying to encourage people to question everything and change everything at the front line, but you're working within traditional hierarchies where you're told what to do. Yeah. And that is a kind of fundamental yeah. cultural shift, and how do you bring that about? Okay. Small question. Yeah, no, I thank you for that. It was a very specific uh, Straight comment. Straightforward. Straightforward. So these are the three um, items remaining for all of you or anyone who would like to comment. Again, the guideline reality, the the private sector role, um, and also the tyranny of the, the of experts. Yep. I guess maybe I will speak a little bit about the guidelines and the and reality on the ground. I mean, you are right. Even in Liberia, we we have similar problem like that. The 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 problem with that is that is 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 top down. Guidelines are created at the top, and then they are given to the people and say, look, this is what you need, you need to do. So um, learning from all our experiences, what we did in Liberia was to take the other approach, at least a little bit bottom up. So sitting with the um, those who will be affected by the guidelines, uh, develop the guidelines together. We think why that is critical is because they create ownership. So when there's ownership, even though the, the reality between the guideline and what is happening on the ground is very difficult, but there's, when there's ownership, uh, people identify with the document and they know that they were part of crafting the document, they are more inclined to implement the document rather than you know it being top down. Yeah, I, I would also start from the guideline. I think I, I would like to underline the need again to have an institutional approach to solving such problems. You know, our experience in Ethiopia has been, you know, if you go to a primary hospital or a district hospital or even a bigger hospital, there are days where, you know, the, the, the corridor, the facility is overcrowded. Usually these are market days where people, especially in rural areas, come you know, uh, to the uh, towns. They, they drop by the, the health facility to seek you know, care or access services. In other times, you see the health facilities are not busy. So it is as much as planning and deploying your resources in an efficient and effective manner to deal with that. So it's not that the guideline is not realistic, but it is how the resources are deployed. You know, there could be instances where guidelines may not be realistic, but if you have the infrastructure at the ground to look at what are the problems, you know, 
that uh, the health service delivery is facing in each health facility, then they should be able to come up with you know, innovations to address that problem. So it's not only a question of having only few nurses or physicians delivering services, but it is how you use you know, the, the, the services and the, the available resources. The power dynamics is uh, the question I really like because um, you know, I think the, the, the beginning, the, the initial step, and the most important thing for countries to do, which you know my country has done over the last 15 years, is you know potentially knowing what you want, knowing the problem you have. Um, the problem we have in many places is you may have a national plan. But that national plan is probably developed by a consultant that is parachuting into the country without good understanding of the situation on the ground. So it all starts with planning. And planning means you know, defining your problem and defining how you really want to deal with that. And if you own that plan, and if you really own what needs to be done, there is no way, you know, money could influence your thinking because you can't influence the thinking of the people with the money. And that's what Ethiopia has successfully done over the last 15 years. Um, you know, the, the, the famous health extension program, I go back to that because, you know, it, it is one example how when it was started, many donors who now claim that you know, it is their baby, we're against it at the beginning. But when you really define that this is the way the country needs to go, and if you put whatever resources you have, then, you know, donors would follow. So I think that's, that's the basic, you know, problem that we have to address in the developing world you know, making sure that countries define the problem and what they want to achieve. That the empowering professional associations and councils is also an interesting approach, but you have to ensure that a proper balance is, um, is maintained when you do that. What I mean is, you know, again, in including my own country, in the beginning, many professional associations were against task shifting some core responsibilities. So we had to pass a law because we can't. I mean, that's what, what I advise many of my former colleagues. If the professional associations become the stumbling block, you are the government, pass a law, go to the parliament, and make sure that you maintain that balance. Because sometimes you are dealing with a professional interest that is, you know, really eager to protect its own territory without really looking at the public health goods of, you know, task shifting some responsibilities. And that, I believe, is the right approach for a government to follow. But at the same time, you have to also make sure that they are part of the, the whatever initiative we do in terms of defining the service standards, in terms of you know, being part of the regulatory services and so on, especially in resource-limited settings where physicians in no way can go to a remote place when they are against training emergency surgical officers to do the basic, you know, emergency surgery, that's, that's not empowering, you know, uh, professional associations. That is actually impeding, you know, public health service delivery. So I think that right balance has to be maintained. And, you know, the hierarchical tradition we have in the medical system is what I, I mean. We need a revolution to change that. You know, when I asked, uh, you know, I was a CEO of one hospital. I'm sorry if I am talking <laughs> too much. You know, I asked my psychiatrist at, at the time to work eight hours a day. They have never done that. 
you know. <laughs> there are only 10 psychiatrists for the entire country. And, you know, when I assumed that office, the outpatient waiting time was six weeks. You know, wow. imagine a patient with severe depression may commit suicide in that, in that period of time. The inpatient admission waiting time was more than six months. So it's, it's, it's a system that was broken. So there was a clear need for the psychiatrist to work long hours, eight hours at least, you know. And, you know, putting in place triaging and so on and so forth was, was really important. But me coming as a CEO telling the psychiatrists who were the guards of that hospital was unthinkable at the time. But when you involve everyone and start that revolution and when you have someone who backs you, you know, the, the, the power that be, you know, within the sector, then you can't really make a, a change. So it, we really need to shake up the system and that's, that's really, you know, important if we are serious about quality. Thank you, Dr. Cassette, for those stirring words. You are a revolutionary, it seems. Um, I just want to give the final couple of comments to Dr. Garcia Saiso and Dr. Viera, please, to start uh, just in brief uh, as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in Indonesia, too many guidelines was developed and too many train was uh, uh, too many health worker was trained. But uh, in the reality, uh, the health program with our health system are working in silos. It is the, pro the big pro pro problem, and also for the uh, culturally uh, attitude toward quality is still a lack of uh, from the professional, and uh, they don't not adhere to use the guideline. Uh, the big problem, the big uh, challenges uh, in our country, uh, we need to change the mindset of the different stakeholders regarding quality and safety, and also uh, how to move out from the silos into the integrity, quality, and the program. Thank you. Really quickly, I don't know if that's possible, but um, just on the gap on between clinical guidelines and, and reality, I, I agree with what's been said before. I mean, there's no link. Uh, Mexico has developed over 800 clinical guidelines, all based on Cochrane methodology, uh, to present the best available evidence on any topic that you want. And then this is not used by clinicians because it's not presented in a way a clinician can use it. So it doesn't really make sense to do this massive document with all available evidence and all graded according to, to the source of this evidence if it's not going to be the right tool for the right people. So that's, that's something very important that, that uh, policymakers have to, have to know. I mean, you have to basically bring down all this evidence to something clinicians can, can use in the five minutes they might have in front of a patient and, and, and how this should help them to make better decisions when they are within, uh, within this context of, of, of uh, um, service provision. So that's, that's what we're trying to change now, basically modify this view of the clinical guideline like this massive document that will lead any, any, anything uh, or any, any provision of service to more of practical algorithms and decision trees for clinicians to know what to do if they have a doubt at any moment. And then on, on how you bring together all these actors, uh, we don't have a problem with, with external donors. For example, in, in Mexico, it's, it's easy to coordinate a few NGOs that work within Mexico. Mexico. But it's, it's a problem to actually bring consensus with all the unions, for example. We have over 300,000 nurses in the country represented, represented by different unions, and then they may protect different bits. And then quality of healthcare is not or might not be the priority for everyone. At least it will, of course, be in, in, in the discourse, but might not be in terms of how much time they dedicate to patients, how much time they work, or, or how to do, for example, transferring between uh, different personal work in different times. And, and this bringing them all to the discussion is a key aspect of this, basically. They have to be part of this. They have to be involved with making all these decisions. And, uh, and this is true as well for the private sector. There was something about the private sector and how do you involve the private sector. Well, it's true as well. What we're doing doesn't really see institutional settings. It sees Mexico as a whole, as a whole country. And so the quality policy applies for everyone from the regulation side 
so it applies to public, social, and private entities. From the uh, uh, perspective side, we, we give resources to both private and public entities to, to improve service, and, and we also provide all these tools and, and training, online training for everyone, not, not necessarily related to an institution study. Thank you, um, and thank you all for those comments. Before I hand over to Dr. Sham Syed for concluding remarks, I want you to join me in a big round of applause, please, for our So good morning, everybody. I'm sure you'll all agree this has been quite a, an intense discussion. There are many things that are probably unanswered, but that was the purpose of this morning, is to actually stimulate our thinking, get things moving on quality. We heard right from the beginning the developmental context that Finn pure, uh, put forward very clearly, but he also came back right to the human moment of, of childbirth. And I think that was a very important start to the day. We heard. Uh, from Lara about the empty promise of access, clearly articulating the need to link UHC and quality. We heard a very important point from Ed Kelly about the opportunity to do something right and how many times you do it right. A very simple way of putting it that my mother could understand. And I think that's probably one of the things that we have a problem with in quality is we do have a tendency of overcomplicating. Um, but we also heard about the humility to learn from our experiences. Margaret placed the local trust right at the heart of the discussion before we had an opportunity to listen to five authors directly, which is a rare opportunity to listen directly from those that are publishing. Um, and of course, um, all of those five aspects are different dimensions of quality that we need to consider. There were granular details, but it's an opportunity over lunch to be able to discuss a little further with them. But we heard the impatience of a quality lead even while the academic uh, colleagues were speaking uh, in terms of Andrew Lee Kaka's question, which was a very impatient question, which is exactly how it should be in terms of how that evidence is going to be translated into change at the front line. I'm a little biased, but I, I, I do think it was the most important session, as Margaret has highlighted, was the final session to understand from the quality leads themselves and an ex-minister of health what does this all mean to them as they move forward? We heard very clearly the linkages between quality and resilience. We heard very clearly the linkage between diabetes and overarching quality. We heard a very imp interesting and important question that delved a little bit deeper into that, but that is a really important area that we need to explore in, in a lot more detail. We heard from somebody who is responsible for millions of people in uh, diverse islands, and this is an important point that sometimes we forget, the unique challenges of small island states or small islands within a state. And then we ha heard the inspirational words from Dr. Cassette, who really emphasized the need for a quality revolution. So I'm just going to add just three big pieces of um, wisdom that I'm taking from this, um, this morning. The first one is, is a no-brainer but it's an important one to emphasize, the linkage between evidence and policy. So when qu quality leads around the world are developing their national quality policies and strategies, they need to be informed directly and in lifetime from the evidence that's being generated. And these quality policies and strategies are being developed as we speak. So this is the right time to get the information to those that can act change. The second one is the learning agenda. We heard the critical importance of making sure that the immense amount of learning, the breadth and depth of learning that exists on issues such as maternal, neonatal and child health, how is that going to be translated into learning for the wider quality community? We have many mechanisms to do that. There are many learning communities around the world to do that, but we need some convergence around that. And the final point is the point about the quality revolution. I think that is an incredibly important point. One of the things that we've clearly heard, and I've had the privilege of, uh, of connecting with many quality leads across the world, I think the time for persuasion, I think we're there. There is no Minister of Health that doesn't recognize quality as a key priority in their agenda today. And I think that, for us, is our call to action. So for that, I do believe that there are a number of global momentum points that we can use. Of course, all action is local, 
but the fact that the global report on quality will be published later on this year. It's a joint endeavor of OECD, World Bank, and WHO. It's an opportunity to keep that global momentum alive. Of course, Margaret has clearly articulated the work of the Lancet Commission, another opportunity to keep the world alive and energized about quality. But ultimately, of course, quality is local and quality is about people. I wanted to thank you all for being here and giving up your time. And I'm going to ask um, Dr. Ed Kelly to give a word of thanks before we close. Thank you. Well, it's just um, as the person who welcomed you in, it's just to send you out. Um, I told everyone they could bring their food in. I just remembered that I had stuffed a croissant in my pocket here <laughs> that I have not eaten. Um, so please take the food out as you leave because that's illegal to bring food and drink into, uh, into these meeting rooms. But we're really very grateful to all the, to all the panelists um, and particularly Margaret's team, but also the, the bulletin team that helped put this together. And really also to all of you, many of you who are very busy. Um, I, the only person I know who is not busy is Anthony Costello, has nothing else to do except worry about quality. So I'm go I, thankfully we were able to fill his otherwise unfilled morning. Um, but uh, clearly, I think we, like Sham said, we didn't propose that this was gonna have all of these answers. But I do think, I'll come back to the point I made earlier that for WHO and under its new leadership, I really do believe personally, and we'll definitely make it part of our work jointly with the work we're doing with Anthony's team, but also with the uh, folks in HIV, TB, malaria, that this is the unifying theme across the, the implementation on, on universal health coverage. And I think that clearly there are, what we tried to talk about here was tease out the universalities of the, of the issues, but also look, every country is going to be particular. And we didn't get into sort of uh, conflict uh, zones and fragile state issues, but there's a lot of work going on there. There's a lot of work going on in the link with emergencies program around uh, how the quality approach needs to be, needs to be uh, modulated. So I, I think the point was that we don't, uh, it's not that we have had all the answers and just nobody's listened to us till now, although I do think that nobody's been listening to us until now, but um, it's good that they're listening uh, now, but I think we need to look at how quality in uh, 2017 and beyond manifests itself in terms of achieving some of these big goals around universal health coverage, uh, achieving health security, advancing the AMR agenda, and achieving the progress on non-communicable diseases. So uh, with that, I'll thank everybody for being here, um, and we'll look forward to being back in touch very soon. Thank you. Yep, good. And can I just mention, uh, thanks to uh, our organizers here, we have lunch outside. So you're welcome to annoy all of the office holders uh, on this floor outside there and, and uh, have some lunch with the panelists. Thank you. I know Michelle very well. She's been talking to you, right? Yeah, she told me all about you, yeah. You're connecting these pieces now. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. No, we'd be eager to see what can happen. I know you're busy in many fronts, so that's the issue. I think it's only so many people and so many things can be tackled. But if quality, if we can get something with Liberia to, for the commission, that would be great. Yeah, for sure. Very nice Evidence. to see you. And these yeah, now we, we can be in yeah, contact, yeah. exactly. I know Michelle told me about you. Or like yeah. Have you not met her before? I was like, mm, no, somehow I, I didn't meet you in Liberia. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Very nice to see you. And thank you for moderating the session. Yeah. And, uh, how's the Lancet Commission going? It's moving. It's very ex extremely busy. <laughs> but we're pushing hard. So I hope uh, we'll see what the feedback is from you and from others. It'll be interesting to, to get the conversation moving, huh? Thank you. Okay, good thank to you see you. Good. Okay, all right. <laughs> Okay.
Yeah. Hi, Mark. Hi. I'm Wonder from Emro, the show Emro in Cairo. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Yeah. So we started some work just thinking about the idea yeah. of how what framework can be developed right. in order to save that safety and quality yeah. and what the quality would mean in these yeah. responses. And you know, in an Embro, for example, like uh, 10 countries out of 20 are in trouble. So this is the priority. Of course, yeah. Uh, and you know exactly how to deal with it for most of the time. Quality and safety will be neglected. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is the idea. Interesting. Okay, yeah. well, I would look forward to any updates if there's a way to. We are now writing up like a project for the idea, okay. okay. and then yeah. we will try to oh, make a okay. program. Okay. This is the first step, and yeah. we will put up with experts. Mm-hmm. After the experts, we will develop some of the okay. okay. paper, like white paper. These are the two steps. Okay, yeah. but research, interviews, whatever they feel, they study, they share, and so on. And then after that, you can come up with something. Yeah. When is the towel going to be ready? Yeah, okay. 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 And then we'll expand this to our community. Could you give me your, your contact here? Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.